Darling, the aroma is so delicious. She heard her husband's voice, whom she had been waiting for from work for over an hour. Anderson had been reproaching her, saying that she wasn't taking care of the house, not getting anything done. But as soon as she left early to prepare something delicious, he wouldn't wait for her. Why did you take so long? I told you I was coming home. Look, I even baked a chicken. It's in the oven. I hope it hasn't cooled down yet. And there's some french fries with the chicken your favorite, but they've already gone cold. Please, heat them up, you know, an urgent order came in, and we had to discuss it. So, we all sat there like prisoners, hungry, cold, and annoyed. Her husband smiled. All right, hurry up and wash your hands, let's eat. I'm really hungry too. The chicken should be amazing. The girls at work gave me a new recipe. My beloved, you're an excellent homemaker. I've told you this so many times. You need to quit your job. You're not making any money anyway. My colleagues at work are making fun of me. When will you finally understand that I want the best for you? Victoria's husband asked. Victoria worked as a junior manager at a company selling cosmetics and household chemicals. She had graduated from a trade institute just a year ago and didn't want to stay at home. Anderson, no one will hire me for a good position without experience anyway, so I'm gaining it. How else? Dowling, why do you need that experience? I earn well enough for my wife to stay at home and raise children. Why don't you understand that? I don't want to stay at home and stagnate. Why don't you understand that? And we don't even have children yet. Let's drop this topic already. No, we won't drop it. I want to come home and see a happy wife. I want the house to smell of freshly cooked food. I don't want to see you tired, stressed, or upset. I care about you above all else. Don't you see that? Anderson, if you cared about me, you'd listen to my desires. I like my job. Yes, the salary isn't huge, but half the country earns that much. It's only you with your five zeros in your salary. Not everyone lives that way. That's what I don't want you to work. We're not struggling. We have an apartment, a closet full of clothes. I bought you a car. What else do you need? Take whatever you want. Any beauty salons and spas are open to you. Go to the gym, hang out with friends, enjoy life. I'm tired of your obsession with the gym. I can't find time to go there. And by the way, I already look great. Morning yoga is enough for me. All my normal friends work, and I'm not interested in mingling with the gym bimbos. Then read books, there's so much interesting stuff there. How about we go somewhere for a vacation, we'll get some new experiences. My vacation isn't coming up soon, and you know that. I can't just drop everything and go whenever you call. I have my principles too. Can we stop this? I'm so tired of these arguments. Can we not discuss this for just one evening? My love, I truly love you. Understand that I'm not saying all this for no reason. I'm your husband. You should listen to me. Isn't that so? Victoria looked up and gazed into his eyes. We're not living in the Middle Ages, darling. Women have rights now too. You'll have to get used to it, she said and went to reheat dinner. Anderson and Victoria had been married for two years. They met when she was in her final year of university. At that time, she was still in love with another guy named Adam. Victoria herself couldn't understand why Adam had left her. Anderson was always there, supporting her when she felt down. Their relationship quickly evolved into something more. Right after graduating from university, Anderson proposed to his beloved girlfriend. Of course, she agreed without hesitation. She didn't even think twice. Where else could she find a husband so tender, understanding, kind, and loving? However, almost immediately after the wedding, Anderson began to change. It seemed subtle, but Victoria could feel it. Pushing aside all doubts, she wanted to believe her husband. She wanted him to be as happy as she was, but something constantly got in the way. When they were dating, Anderson used to say that women should definitely work, especially with higher education. He even promised to help her get a job at their company, even if it wasn't the most prestigious position. But when it came down to it, there were no available positions. Oh, Victoria, why do you need this job? You're my wife, and I'll give you anything you want, he insisted. But Victoria wasn't that kind of woman. 
Inside, she was also ambitious and determined. She had so much energy, so many desires and plans. She still found a job, despite her husband's opposition. She secretly felt a bit hurt that he couldn't help her get a job at his own company, but she didn't say anything. What was the point? She managed on her own. When her husband learned that his wife had become an office worker, he wasn't pleased at all. They argued, but in the end, he would always confess his love and say sweet things, confusing his wife. From the outside, it really seemed like he cared about her, but Victoria was sure that it wasn't that simple. At some point, without even realizing it, Victoria began to get used to the constant fights about her job. She didn't like it, but it no longer irritated her as much. Instead, it evoked a sense of guilt, especially when her husband complained about the lack of coziness in their home. Dowling, the floor is sticky. Why didn't you clean it? Anderson, I cleaned it yesterday. Did you forget? I just got back from work, just like you. I'll clean it a little later. See, if you didn't work, you'd have enough time for cleaning. We wouldn't have to live in this mess. In reality, their home was always clean. Things were in their places. Dishes were washed right after meals. No one left things lying around. But Anderson always managed to find something to criticize. A couple of times, Victoria hinted to her husband that if he disliked the dust on the TV or the bedding not being freshly changed within two days, he could clean up himself. Or they could hire a housekeeper as a last resort. Sure, let's hire one, but we'll pay her from your salary, all right. Anderson persisted. In short, arguing with him was pointless. He always found arguments or excuses to silence his wife. Moreover, he often did so tenderly and affectionately. One evening, Anderson simply didn't come home. Victoria waited until 8 o'clock, but then couldn't hold back and called. Where are you? She asked when he answered the call. I'm staying at my friend's place today, and I'll be there until you quit your job. My wife shouldn't work, he said and hung up. Victoria was taken aback by such audacity. No discussions, just plain and uncompromising. She called him again, but he didn't pick up, and then he turned off his phone altogether. Two days passed, and Anderson still hadn't returned home. Victoria returned to an empty apartment and felt even guiltier. She really didn't want to give up her job but she saw no other choice, but divorce because of this. She waited a few more days, but when a week had gone by, she couldn't take it anymore and quit. She sent a message to her husband, and he returned home the same evening. When Anderson arrived, Victoria was clearly not in a good mood. She didn't like that it had come to this. She wanted more understanding and respect from her husband, but there was none. Anderson chose to ignore his wife's resentments. He came home with a luxurious bouquet of flowers and a charming smile on his face, literally handing her the bouquet. He scooped her up and spun her around like a little girl. I'm so glad, my love, that you finally listened to me. You're the best wife in the world, he said, looking at her with love and tenderness, as if he hadn't been away from home for a week. A week later, Victoria sat on the shore of the Aegean Sea in Greece, and she couldn't help but wonder why she had resisted her husband for so long. They had been there for four days already. Four unforgettable days. Her husband seemed to have turned into that ideal man she thought he was when they first met. Anderson carried her in his arms, showered her with compliments and gifts. Every day he organized different romantic gestures, as if it were their honeymoon. Not two years since they got married. You would think, live and be happy, but Victoria didn't feel that inner tranquility. She was on edge all the time, and she couldn't understand how he managed to criticize her all the time yet remained so sweet. One day on the beach, a beauty with charming curves walked past them. She had a toned bottom and gorgeous legs, defined arms and abs. Anderson looked admiringly at the girl as she passed by and said to his wife, See, dear, soon you'll start going to the gym and you'll look just like that, right? Victoria looked at him with a sense of hurt. Then she glanced at her own body. She was slender and graceful. She herself didn't like those muscular girls like the one they saw, and she definitely had no intention of becoming one. No way, darling, I'm never going to be like that. If she likes it, 
let her work out until she drops. Personally, I believe a woman should be delicate and graceful, she said. Of course, you will, sweetheart. You want to be perfect, don't you? You just need to prepare yourself mentally. Anderson joked, kissed her on the lips, and went to take a dip. As soon as they returned from Greece, Anderson handed his wife an envelope with a mysterious look. Inside was a membership pass to the best fitness center in their city. Victoria looked at him and frowned, recalling the incident on the beach. Aren't you happy? Do you realize how much it costs? Many women can only dream of such a gift, and it's all free for you, since you're my wife and I love you very much. You should give it a try, all right, and don't pout, or you'll get wrinkles. Then you'll have to get a spa membership too. Reluctantly, Victoria accepted her husband's gift, although deep down, she felt hurt by how he didn't listen to her desires. A week later, she finally cooled down a bit and decided to go to the fitness center after all. Maybe out of boredom, since spending the whole day just cleaning and cooking wasn't interesting. It turned out there were group yoga classes with a good instructor, as well as a sauna and a pool. Victoria didn't even enter the weightlifting area. She just glimpsed it as she passed by, watching those girls squatting with barbells. She shuddered slightly. She didn't like any of it. When Anderson found out she liked the fitness center, he was thrilled. See, and you didn't want to try it. I do everything for you. Just appreciate it, and we'll always be happy together. A month passed, but he didn't notice any expected changes in his wife's figure. None at all. Darling, do you even go to that fitness center? He asked one day. You know I do. Three times a week, she calmly replied, but she already sensed that something was brewing. In a month, she managed to adapt and even found a couple of friends who kept her company. It was fun and enjoyable to do something other than household chores. Honey, can you be more specific? Anderson asked more persistently. Sure, I go to the pool, yoga classes, and the sauna. Her husband looked displeased. You do realize I didn't get you that membership just for the pool or sauna, right? I wanted you to get a bit more toned. I understand. I remember that girl on the beach, but I told you back then that I don't like it. Sweetie, but you should primarily please me, right? I'm not asking you to change drastically. I already like how you look. I just think you resemble a child with skinny legs and arms, and I want you to look like a woman. Can't you understand that? Victoria suspected he would say something like this, and it was uncomfortable. Anderson, isn't this going too far? No, my dear, it's not. Otherwise, why spend so much money? Think about it. Wouldn't you at least try? It's all inclusive for you. You can choose a trainer to help and guide you. Want me to go with you? Show you what it's like. Anderson, I don't want to go to the gym. It's not my thing. And that's final. Final. Is that how you talk to your beloved husband? You're denying me this now. And what's next? Will you lock the bedroom doors? We didn't agree on this. You're exaggerating. First sports, and now love. These are different things. Well, sports can also affect our personal life. Don't you want me to desire you? Do you want me to admire you? Can't you admire me for who I am? Darling, it's about fashion. I'm a modern man after all. I like modern women, and modern women need to take care of themselves. Look on the internet. Skinny girls are not in fashion now. You need to change. Or don't you agree? No, I don't agree. I'm not asking you to change for me. That's because I'm naturally perfect. Aren't I? He asked, expecting his wife to agree right away. And it was hard for her not to agree. Her husband was indeed good looking. He also went to the gym, which was on the ground floor of the office building where he worked. He enjoyed working out on the machines, but Victoria didn't force him into it, and she didn't demand him to be perfect. Anderson, this isn't fair, and you know it perfectly well. Maybe, but if you don't change your mind, once the membership expires, I won't buy you a new one. I don't see the point. You still have a few months to think about it. He added with a smile and left for another room, leaving his wife with a sense of disappointment. The next day, she couldn't hold it in and complained to one of her new friends about her husband. However, Gwen didn't share her sorrow at all. Listen, you live in a big apartment, eat whatever your heart desires. Your closet is bursting with clothes, 
you have your own car, and all of this is thanks to your husband. Is it really that hard for you to compromise for him? If I had a husband like that, I wouldn't just tone my butt for him. I'd even get breast implants. Gwen said, maybe you're right. Victoria thought to herself and headed towards the gym. The trainer noticed her right away as she was a newcomer. He showed her the equipment, explained what to do and how. He assisted and gave tips during her first session, making sure not to overload her. Some girls looked at her almost with disdain, while others with obvious curiosity. During the workout, Victoria constantly felt an internal discomfort, but she didn't give up. In the evening, when her husband returned home, his wife didn't say anything to him, but he was very observant and noticed that her gait had become heavier. So, did you finally give it a try? He asked. And I didn't really like it, she replied. But now you have a reward waiting for you. I don't need anything. You'll like it. First, there will be a relaxing massage, then a bath, and then a loving husband, he said. Victoria wanted to decline, but she knew it would be futile. Anyway, he would do whatever he wanted. Refusing her husband her conjugal duty wasn't allowed. Before sleeping, Anderson kissed his wife's shoulder and said, You're the most wonderful to me. I love you so much. I'm proud of you. Soon, you won't recognize your own body, and everyone will admire you. It seemed like he was saying such wonderful things, but instead of feeling joy, Victoria experienced entirely different emotions. Two weeks had passed. A company party was coming up at Anderson's workplace. He was determined to take his wife along to show off to his friends. You need a new dress. Get ready. We're going to the mall. He calmly said as Victoria came out of the bathroom. Why? I have many beautiful dresses. I don't want to go anywhere right now. You need a beautiful dress. Red and form-fitting. I envision you at the party just like that. Anderson, I definitely don't want that. Never mind, you'll be the most beautiful one there. Don't even argue with me. Get ready. We're leaving in an hour. In moments like these, Victoria realized that she didn't have much of a choice. She dried her hair, put on makeup, and called her husband when she was ready. Another 10 minutes, Anderson said, flipping for TV channels. But I'm already ready. I'm not ready yet. But you're not doing anything. His wife protested. Darling, just 10 more minutes. Head on, we'll get you a new dress soon. Don't worry, he said as if she had asked him an hour ago. Victoria shook her head and went to the kitchen to grab a bite to eat while there was time. She hadn't even taken a single bite when her husband rushed in. What are you doing? I want to eat, she calmly replied. And how are you going to try on a dress with a full stomach? Put down the sandwich. We'll grab a snack somewhere on the way. Promise. Of course, let's go. It's time. But it hasn't been 10 minutes yet. It's time. Let's go her husband said coldly and calmly. Victoria obediently left the house and got into the car. Deep down, she hoped that they wouldn't buy exactly the type of dress he wanted. She felt uncomfortable in such outfits, but she was willing to endure one evening of discomfort for his happiness as well. Her hopes were dashed. The dress awaited them in the third boutique, and it fit Victoria perfectly when she tried it on. You look so beautiful, Anderson said admirably. Looking at his wife, I think a different hairstyle would suit this dress. Let's go get you a bob. A bob? I don't want short hair, Anderson. His wife protested. It will suit you so well, he insisted. Right, he asked, turning to the saleswoman. The girl smiled and added, and you need high-heeled shoes to match. Absolutely. Victoria had medium-length hair, and she liked her hairstyle. Imagining herself with an elongated bob, she pursed her lips. Anderson, this is getting excessive. I can tie my hair up, and it will be fine. I won't cut it. Of course you will. Let's not make a scene at the mall. You're a grown woman. Behave accordingly. Anderson, I won't cut it, his wife insisted. Let's just go to the salon and ask the stylist if such a hairstyle suits you or not, he suggested. Okay, let's just ask, his wife agreed hoping that he would let it go after that. They went downstairs and entered the beauty salon. They were greeted by a lovely girl with a charming smile. Hello, my wife wants to get an elongated bob. 
he said and winked at the stylist. What do you think? Will this hairstyle suit her? Hello, my name is Janice, the girl said, approaching Victoria. By the way, an elongated bob will really suit you. You have a triangular face shape. I'm sure you'll be pleased. Victoria grimaced in displeasure. Anderson, I don't want to. Let's leave. We asked. Janice said it would suit you. Take a seat and stop arguing with me, he said, pulling his wife's hand. And then let's go have lunch. You wanted to. Come on, we're just wasting time. After about 40 minutes, Victoria left the salon with her new hairstyle. Just a couple of meters away, she noticed Zara, her friend. Zara, Victoria called out happily. Her friend turned around and didn't immediately recognize her. Hey, why did you suddenly decide to get a haircut? She asked Victoria with a smile. Don't you like it? It looks good. It's just that you always said you love your curls, so I'm surprised. Anderson decided to join the conversation, approaching them. Hello, tell her it looks very good, right? Let me guess. Was it your idea? Zaro inquired. No, of course not. Bowling asked for it herself. I can't refuse her in anything. From Victoria's expression, her friend could tell that her husband wasn't being fair, but she decided it was pointless to discuss it now. Are you home already or what a Victoria? Maybe you'll come shopping with me. I want to buy new shoes. We were planning to grab a bite to eat. Would you like to join us? Anderson offered. How about you let her come with me? I'll feed her a little later myself, Zara interjected. Are you up for it? Can I go with Sarah? She asked with a smile. Dowling, let's do it another time. Even better, you and Brian should come over to our place in the evening. I think it would be great tomorrow. Yes, I'd love to, Zara. Will you come? Victoria asked excitedly. Visits from guests were rare, especially her friends. She didn't want to miss out on such an opportunity. Zara agreed and went on with her shopping while the couple headed home. Or at least Victoria thought they were heading home, but her husband took her to the fitness center. Just one more week until the corporate event. You need to work out every day. I'll leave you here. I'll be back in a couple of hours, he said and drove away. Victoria felt like she was just a puppet in his hands. How had she ever agreed to this? Now he demanded more and more workouts every day. He had even talked to her trainer once, explaining which muscle groups needed special attention. The next evening, the couple was expecting guests. Zara and Brian arrived on time, but Victoria's preparations weren't quite finished yet. She needed another half an hour to wrap things up. Are you trying to embarrass me on purpose? Her husband exploded when their guest's car pulled up. It's not a big deal. Just have a glass of wine while I finish up, she said, hoping to appease him. Victoria felt hurt. It was uncomfortable for her. She had initially planned different dishes, but her husband had changed everything when he found out the dinner menu. She should have started much earlier than planned. That's why she ran out of time. Interestingly, she understood all of this, yet she still felt guilty. Anderson went to welcome the guests. He was charming and polite, as usual. He complimented the dress of his wife's friend, admired her hairstyle. He looked at her in such a way that even Brian felt a bit jealous for a moment. Victoria didn't hear any of it. She was still in the kitchen. When Zara came to her, leaving the men to chat, her friend looked distressed. What's wrong? I'm running a bit late. And is that really a reason to be so upset? Let me help you, Zara offered. No need. There's just a little left to do here. When the table was set, everyone sat down to have dinner. The food turned out to be delicious, but intentionally, Anderson criticized each of her dishes. Zara heard it all and at some point couldn't hold back. Maybe that's enough. Your wife put in so much effort, and instead of saying thank you, you're criticizing her. Don't teach me how to talk to my wife, please. Anderson coldly replied, Dowling, you do understand that I just want it to be even better next time, right? Victoria simply nodded. It was uncomfortable for her to listen to him, but she tried not to argue in front of the guests. Vera raised her champagne glass and proposed a toast to your family and its future members. Anderson even choked a bit out of surprise. Are you pregnant? Victoria shook her head. No, of course not, and I'm not planning to be anytime soon. It's still too early. 
Brian was surprised by now. When are you planning to have kids then? Around 35 or something. Why 35? But definitely not now. I'm not ready to become a mother yet. Anderson wasn't pleased with the response. He had told her before that they would start planning for a child in a couple of years. No, 35 is too late, but 27 would be just right. Isn't that right, darling? I think waiting until 30 is fine. His wife responded, you think, darling, just think. When dinner was over, Zara led her friend to the dressing room, supposedly to check out the new dress that her husband had praised so much. Why do you let him talk to you like that? She asked. Victoria pondered her friend's question as she put on the new dress for the corporate event. She didn't like how her husband had behaved at the table either. More accurately, she didn't like that he did it in front of their friends. At home, they often had such misunderstandings, but she tried not to pay attention to them. Zara, I agree that Anderson isn't in the best mood today. Not in the mood. Are you serious? If he talks to you like that in front of us, I can only imagine what goes on when you're alone at home. Everything is fine with us. Don't worry. Trust me. Victoria insisted. Dowling, maybe you really don't realize it, but this isn't normal. Just tell me, why do you allow this? Zara, he loves me. He takes care of me. Isn't that worth putting up with a little discomfort sometimes? Victoria, loves, do you really think so? Love is first and foremost about respect, and there's clearly a lack of that in his attitude towards you. You don't understand. We've known each other for a long time, since school. I've told you about my mother and my older brother. I've always dreamed of finding someone who would simply love me and tell me that every day. And Anderson is exactly that, believe me, the girl said with a sad smile. Victoria grew up in a fatherless family. She and her brother were raised by their mother, but while she loved Jack dearly and spared nothing for him, it was completely different with her daughter. Little Victoria did everything to earn her mother's love, but it was all in vain, and her brother constantly brought her problems, often laying his mischievous acts on her. At times, it seemed to her that Jack deliberately came up with various pranks just to see how their mother would shout at her, as if it brought him pleasure even more so than tapping her or taking away her toys when no one was looking. When Victoria finished school, it was as if she was thrown out of the family. Their mother paid for her brother's education at a prestigious university, but when the daughter mentioned that she also wanted to enroll, she heard from her mom only, there is no money, figure it out yourself if you want higher education. And she did figure it out as best as she could. While other students enjoyed themselves at college parties, Victoria worked as a waitress or washed dishes in restaurants. One day, she was noticed by a designer who asked her to model for his new clothing line. No, he wasn't famous or wealthy, but her face seemed suitable to him. It was women like her, elegant and lovely, for whom he created his collection. Victoria, of course, agreed. It was her first experience, but later, Thanks to the photographer she worked with on that shoot, she began receiving similar requests more often. And suddenly, at some point, Victoria managed to realize that she truly was beautiful. This helped her get through college, supporting herself living on a scholarship was simply impossible. And does he tell you every day that he loves you? The friend persisted. Yes, he does. I feel his love in his words, in his gaze, in his touch, usually. He's completely different. Yes, he does have bad days sometimes, but doesn't everyone? Victoria, yes, everyone does, but I think in your case, things aren't as smooth as you think. It's like your relationship is all about him, and you're just like a free add-on to him. I still can't believe he convinced you to quit your job. Well, yes, there he went a bit too far, I won't deny it, but he do take care of me. Trust me. Or maybe he's trying to cut off any escape routes. If you're not working, you're completely dependent on him. So what? He doesn't mind spending for me. We have enough money. I have everything I need. Don't I? When was the last time you got a manicure outside the house? Remember, we used to have a tradition. We'd go to the same salon just to chat while getting our nails done. And now, he bought you all those gadgets and paid for a three-week course so you could do your own nails at home. 
why do you think he did that? So I wouldn't get bored. So I wouldn't be reliant on nail technicians. Actually, it's quite convenient, I assure you. Yeah, and if it's so convenient, then why was he against it when I asked you to do my nails? I think he wants us to communicate less. Nonsense, he's not against us spending time together, I'm telling you for sure. Then why aren't you spending time with Kimberly anymore? Victoria let out a sigh of sadness, recalling the situation when her husband kicked her friend out of their house. Zara, she allowed herself too much, shouted at my husband in our own home. If I yelled at your Brian like that and said such nasty things, you'd also stop talking to me. I saw her recently. We accidentally ran into each other downtown, and she said that Anderson deliberately provoked her. You just didn't understand that. She's just making excuses. Nothing more. Trust me. Have you even noticed how often you say phrases like trust me or I assure you? Why do you think that is? And why is that? Because you often hear them. And you really want to believe that your husband loves you. But please, don't lose yourself. I'm not losing myself. I think with him, I'm becoming a better person. I even like my new hairstyle now. Victorian said with a smile. Already. So, initially, you didn't want to get a haircut. That's what I'm talking about. Just try asking him to change for you even once, and you'll hear what happens. And what do you think will happen? Victoria asked, puzzled. First, he won't want to change. Second, he'll find plenty of excuses not to do it. And in the end, he'll make you look foolish. Zara, you're exaggerating now, trust me. Victoria bristled at the last phrase. Apparently, she was using her husband's words without realizing it. Okay, enough about the sad stuff. How do you like my dress? She asked, twirling around. Beautiful, or rather, you look beautiful in it. But can you even breathe in it? I'll try really hard, Victorian said and laughed. Just at that moment, Anderson walked into the room. Ladies, where were you hiding? We were already waiting for you, he said more cheerfully. Then he looked appraisingly at his wife and added, Sweetheart, you're pure perfection. I'm amazed. In his gaze, there was so much passion and admiration that even Zara believed, for a moment, that he truly loved her friend. But his next statement brought her back to reality. You do realize that you'll have to not eat the whole evening to look perfect. Seriously, and will you allow her to at least breathe? The friend asked, annoyed. If she behaves herself properly, Anderson quipped, is it joking, but it sounded somewhat threatening. All right, sweetheart, change your clothes, and please, put on a different dress, not the one you were wearing. It makes you look a bit plump. Giving instructions, he left the room. Zara nearly choked with anger but decided that acting blindly would be wrong. She resolved to somehow get through to her friend, even if not today. Brian left their house with a disappointed expression, but Victoria still didn't understand what had happened. Their friends left almost immediately when the girls came downstairs. What could have possibly occurred? Anderson was also displeased. His face revealed that she would soon find out everything. When Victoria cleared the table and washed the dishes, her husband came into the kitchen. Are you done already? He nervously asked. Almost. By the way, if we had a dishwasher, it would be much quicker, honey. Maybe we should buy one. You wanted to ask for it, so maybe you should buy it. After all, I'll have to pay for it in the installation, since it's apparently too hard for you to wash two plates. Why are you being so mean? Anderson was almost in a rage, but he pretended that everything was fine. I don't want them to come over again. Them. What's wrong with Brian? He's a nice guy, isn't he? Oh yes, a nice guy. I can practically feel myself becoming a beggar just being around him. It's disgusting. Honey, you know how important a person's environment is. If you want to be a lady, you need to associate with educated and well-off people. At this point, Victoria was surprised. Brian earned well, just like Zara and herself. Calling them beggars was an exaggeration. I think you're wrong, the wife protested. They are perfectly decent people. Zara has been my friend for many years. Exactly, my dear, you think that? Trust me, I'm much older than you and I understand people better. 
Anderson was nine years older than his wife. He believed that this truly gave him a significant advantage. Anderson, I know you're older, but I've known Zara since our second year. We've been through a lot together. She's always supported me. Well, yes, and when you were dating that loser, she was there too. Maybe you're so attached to her because of those past memories. Just so you know, I won't tolerate it. If you want to go back to your old life, I won't stop you. Trust me, I know what's best for you. Anderson, let's stop arguing. Zara's eyes, my friend. I love her. Let's just leave it at that. Dowling, and I love you. I care about you first and foremost. Can't you understand? Honey, please stop. I'm asking you. If you don't have something specific to say, don't talk badly about her anymore. Anderson lowered his gaze and pondered for a moment, then raised his eyes and looked at his wife. I didn't want to tell you this, but the thing is, she's envious of you. All girls envy each other sometimes. There's nothing wrong with that. Please calm down. She's not envious of your clothes, can you see? She's making eyes at me when you're not looking. Trust me, it won't end well. Anderson was confident that this statement would have the desired effect. And he was almost right. When she went to take a shower, Anderson took her phone to check, as usual, who she called, messaged, and where she had been. Just at that moment, a message arrived from Zara. She had sent some link. Anderson immediately followed the link and landed on an article with a sensational title. Domestic abuse. He read a bit, smirked, and deleted the message a few seconds later, as if it had never existed. Anderson didn't admit that he had overheard part of their conversation in the dressing room, and he didn't like that at all. A few days passed. The evening of the corporate party arrived. Victoria was all decked out and looked stunning. Perfect. Simply perfect. Dowling, you're a gift from fate. How lucky I am to have you, Anderson said, gazing at his wife with loving eyes. He purposely came to pick her up from work so she wouldn't have to take a taxi alone. Thank you, dear. I could have made it on my own, his wife calmly said. It's no trouble for me. Okay, can we go now? She asked, anticipating the party. Of course, did you remember everything? He asked, waiting for her nod. Then he added, all right, let's go then. Tonight, you'll outshine everyone. Anderson had several simple rules for his wife. Smile broadly only to women, not men. Don't discuss personal matters with colleagues' wives and girlfriends. Don't drink champagne, only wine. When Victoria entered the restaurant, she immediately noticed the admiring glances of many guests. She looked like Cinderella at a royal ball. Nobody really knew her, but she looked enchanting. Anderson walked beside her and looked just as good as his wife. A prince, no less. Some ladies flirtatiously smiled at him when they greeted. For some reason, Victoria didn't like that much. Most likely, because her husband didn't often, but from time to time, dropped remarks about how popular he was among women. Anderson escorted his wife to their table, pulled her chair out with care, as if she couldn't have sat down without his help. He declined the champagne offered by the waiter and personally poured wine for her. From the outside, he looked like a loving husband who adored his wife. After hearing several compliments directed at Victoria, Anderson was very pleased. He was proud of her, as if she were a newly purchased car. And it's not surprising, considering he had meticulously planned her image. At their table sat only the top management of the company. Conversations were mostly about business and new clients. The wives were bored, that was immediately obvious. At some point, Layla, the wife of their CEO, had enough of it. Ladies, let's move closer. I'm quite tired of these conversations. Or shall we go dance? As soon as the bait was thrown, guests began to rearrange themselves at the table. The men moved closer to each other, and the women moved to the other end of the table to boast and chat about their feminine matters. Victoria made a slight movement to switch to the women's side, but Anderson thoughtfully placed his hand on her knee. She gave him a pleading look, but he didn't remove his hand. She had to continue listening to the dull men's talk about work. In reality, the conversations weren't as dull as she thought. It was just that she wasn't allowed to join in, even though she had things to say. Her husband had warned her about that in advance. 
Even if they ask you something, which is unlikely, you should respond with something like, it's better to ask my husband. He's more knowledgeable about the company's affairs than I am. Got it. Back then, Victoria only nodded in agreement, but now she understood that it was wrong and somewhat hurtful. Sometimes she wanted to defy him, but the thought of her husband's disapproval afterwards made the desire fade away. She was tired of sitting idly, but she endured. At some point, she leaned towards her husband and whispered, Can you at least let me go to the restroom? Not to the restroom, dear, but to touch up your makeup. He whispered in response, Go ahead, just be quick. Victoria left when only three men were left at the table. They were all friends of her husband's from their poker games. Clinton couldn't resist and asked, How? How did you manage it? What did I manage? Anderson inquired coldly. To raise such an obedient wife. Oh, you mean to say train? He added with a smirk and chuckled. Anderson gave a slight chuckle, as if he didn't want to share his secrets. It's simple. I love her very much, he said meaningfully. Seriously though, give me a couple of lessons. My Leona is a complete mess. How do you do it? Anderson deliberately leaned back in his chair, trying to look like an all-knowing guru, then smiled broadly and said, All women are foolish. They love thruff their ears. You can tell them anything thruff their ears. The main thing is to say I love you and I care about you 50 times a day. I've been through this many times. An experience has never let me down. I still don't understand how that works. Explain. Clinton insisted. Well, here's a simple example. Victoria wanted to come to the corporate event in her own car. I talked her out of it, convincing her that it's uncomfortable and unsafe to drive in such a luxurious dress. So she decided to take a taxi. A snap of my fingers, and now she believes that all taxi drivers are sleazy, just dreaming of undressing her somewhere along the way. Yeah, and you had to chase after her all over the city. Who's the winner in that situation? Clinton persisted. Of course, me. Next time, she'll take my words as the ultimate truth in all situations. It's not a quick process, but it's quite engaging. The key is to be vigilant and plan everything, and you also need a brain. All right, let's say I get it, but where do I start? We've been married for a year, and my wife doesn't want to listen to me at all. Carl asked with frustration in his voice. First, convince her that you truly love her. Don't skimp on compliments and gifts. Let her think you're completely under her control. That's when you'll be able to subdue her will and reason. Carl shook his head. He couldn't believe this would work with his wife. Or maybe he just didn't have enough patience for it. Not sure if this will work, he said. I'm intrigued. Clinton admitted. Don't you want to write a book with step-by-step -step and detailed instructions? Oh sure. Maybe I'll start writing memoirs in my old age. Anderson laughed in response. Victoria returned, and the conversation on this topic quieted down. The men had already been curious about her the entire evening, but now they looked at her with even more interest, as if trying to verify if all of this was true. However, she didn't understand anything and decided to ignore it. As they were getting ready to leave, Clinton asked Anderson, while his wife stepped away for a moment to say goodbye to some other women. So you're saying that you can convince a woman to do anything this way? Pretty confident, yeah. So, can you convince her to sleep with someone else for your sake? For a split second, Anderson had a strong urge to punch his friend. Are you an idiot? Why would I want that? Well, you know, to prove your point. I didn't go through all this effort for that. I just want a compliant wife at home. I get that you're trying to tease me, but better not play such games with me, you'll lose." Anderson said menacingly. Somewhere deep inside, Anderson was sure that he simply loved his wife and truly did all of this for her well-being. Everything else was just details for self-affirmation. He had fallen in love with her at first sight, even when he saw her with another man. He had already decided back then that Victoria would be his, and nothing would stop him. He had succeeded beyond measure in his plan, and he believed he had executed it perfectly. After the corporate event, Anderson drove his wife home. When she attacked her food, he gave her a stern look. Are you purposely eating so voraciously to make me feel guilty? He asked. What? I'm hungry. 
The dress can finally come official all evening. I've been dreaming of a sandwich, she said. You'd better dream of how you'll thank your husband for this wonderful evening, he said with a mysterious smile. I won't feel grateful until I eat. No gratitude without food, Victoria flirtatiously replied and took another bite. On the weekend, Anderson decided to treat his wife and take her to a hotel outside the city. Beautiful nature, a pool, a spa, Italian cuisine, and a horse riding club, she loved all of that. He had bucked the room in advance but informed her about the trip at the last moment, as usual. She wasn't against it, although she wasn't as thrilled as he expected. When they arrived, Victoria was already in a sour mood. However, seeing the hotel and its surroundings, she felt somewhat calmer. It was really beautiful and quiet here. The couple dropped their things off in the room and went down to the restaurant for a bite to eat. Victoria was sitting at the table, waiting for her husband to return from the restroom when she noticed a familiar face among the other guests. She wasn't pleased at all, as it was her brother, whom she hadn't seen in many years. Jack also noticed her and got up to greet her. When Victoria saw this, she wanted to flee to the other side of the world just to escape. Seeing him approaching, a mixture of resentment and fear grew within her. Hey there, sis, her brother said with a sweet smile. You haven't aged at all. Hello, she replied curtly, burying her nose in the menu, hoping her husband would show up any moment now. And it did happen that way. Anderson spotted the stranger near his wife and quickened his pace. Catching up to him, he politely inquired, Can I help you? And who are you? Jack retorted, I'm this lovely lady's husband. And who might you be? Jack chuckled, curiously sizing up his sister's seemingly inconsequential husband, and responded rather cheerfully, I'm her brother. I'm Jack. Pleasure to meet you. He extended his hand for a handshake. Anderson smiled and shook hands with the unexpected guest. Very intriguing. I haven't met any of Victoria's family members before. I'm Anderson. Pleased to meet you. Meanwhile, Victoria continued to carefully study the menu, pretending that none of this concerned her. Are you here alone? Anderson unexpectedly asked. No, I'm with my wife. Jack replied and gestured toward a cute girl about 10 years younger than him who was sitting quietly at a table in another part of the room. Why don't you join us? At this point, Victoria couldn't hold back. Honey, I think this is a bad idea. Jack smiled at his sister as if they were the best of friends. What are you talking about? We haven't seen each other in ages. I'd be happy to meet my potential brother-in-law. After all, we didn't even know you were married. The brother waved his hand to his wife, inviting her to join. She obediently stood up from the table and approached. The girl looked embarrassed. Meet my dear wife. Her name is Louise. Louise seemed to be in confusion, as if she didn't understand what was happening or what to expect. Darling, meet my sister Victoria. In this eyes her husband Anderson. Pleasure to meet you, the girl said with a sweet smile. Victoria observed her potential sister-in-law with curiosity and couldn't grasp what was wrong with her. Moreover, she felt like she resembled someone else she knew quite strongly. Anderson noticed his wife's displeasure, but his curiosity knew no bounds. He knew nothing about her family. She stubbornly refused to talk about them, mentioning only once that their mother always favored her brother. That was it. A waiter approached, and they placed their orders. To her surprise, Victoria noticed that Jack had chosen the same dishes for himself and his wife just like her own husband had. It was so odd. Louise hardly looked up. She would either glance at the tablecloth, the dishes, or the restaurant's interior. She remained silent the entire time, much like Victoria. But why? At that moment, more than anything else in the world, Victoria wished that Jack would somehow magically disappear from the restaurant and never show up in her life again. Darling, is something wrong? He asked, concern in his voice. Everything's wrong. Can I go to the room? No, of course not. For once, I have the chance to learn more about you, and you want to run away. Family is important. Any other family, but mine. His wife replied boldly. Sweetie, don't be rude. Anderson said somewhat threateningly, giving his wife a meaningful look to keep her in check. Jack watched all of this and reveled in it openly. 
He was convinced that Victoria had gotten exactly the kind of husband she deserved. Victoria looked at her husband and brother, struggling to understand why it felt like they had some similarities. On the surface, Anderson was always so tender, attentive, loving, and gentle, though occasionally stern with her. But Jack was a different person in her memories, the one she had hated for so long. And now they seemed similar to her. Something must be off, or was something wrong with her mind? Sometimes Victorine even doubted her own judgments. She decided to shift her focus from her brother to his wife. Lee's seemed so quiet and a little melancholic. Could it be that Jack was overstepping boundaries with his wife? Louise, are you studying or working? Victoria unexpectedly asked. The girl looked up at her, then stole a glance at her husband. He subtly nodded in response. I'm a homemaker. And how long have you known each other? We've been together for five years, Louise answered. In appearance, she was just over 20 years old. Did you meet when you were still in school? A Victoria asked with a smile. Louise lowered her gaze and didn't answer. Her husband interrupted her. And we have wonderful news. My Louise is pregnant. We'll have a child soon. You'll have a nephew, by the way. The news didn't bring any joy to his sister. Instead, it seemed to upset her. And she didn't even want to hear about their relationship. Congratulations, Anderson said with a smile, shaking Jack's hand again. Thank you. And when will you have your own? We're not in a rush with that, Anderson replied. Why is that? You should hurry up. Continuation of the lineage is important. Jack said playfully. We'll decide that for ourselves, Anderson retorted with an annoyed expression. For some reason, he disliked talking about children. He didn't like when people hinted that they should hurry. He didn't want to witness his wife turning into a sphere on legs. He wanted to delay that moment as much as possible. As the lunch came to an end and the plates were cleared, the couples bid farewell but agreed to meet again, this time in the city, as Jack and Louise were planning to head home. This news particularly pleased Victoria. She didn't want to see her brother anymore. Not today, not ever. Anderson squinted, looking at his wife. Her reaction surprised him more than it irritated him, but he didn't plan to spoil their short vacation further. The weekend passed and the work week began. Victoria was home alone again. Today she decided to go to the gym in the evening and leave the morning for pampering. Anderson warned her that he'd be late, so she wasn't worried. She planned to do her nails, then take a bath with aromatherapy oils, and then tackle her tasks. Suddenly she remembered how Zara had complained that they no longer spent time together and decided to call her. Zara, she said when her friend finally picked up, are you busy? Thank goodness, you called. I was afraid to dial your number myself. We need to meet urgently. What happened, although, that's actually why I'm calling. Can you come over? I'll do your manicure. It's interesting to work on someone else's hands for a change. It's always me, myself, and I, Victorine said with a smile. Is Anderson not there? Her friend inquired. No, he won't be back until the evening. Will you come? I have so much to tell you. I saw my little brother. Can you believe it? I'll be there in 15 minutes, Zara said and hung up. Victoria couldn't understand why her friend was so upset, but she figured that if Zara spoke about it, she might feel better. She went to prepare the table where she usually did her nails, so everything would be ready by the time her friend arrived. Zara didn't keep her waiting for long. At first, she wanted to spill everything right away. But upon hearing about her brother, she decided to hold off a bit and find out what had happened with them. Hello, dear. Victoria greeted her friend with a smile. Hey, my dearest. How are you? Zara asked. I'm fine. Do you want to tell me everything right away or suggest something to start with? Let's have some tea first, Zara agreed. Over me, Victoria told her about the unexpected encounter with her brother and how their weekend had gone. It seemed that everything wasn't so bad, but Sarah understood much more than her friend realized. Do you know why you thought that Jack and Anderson resembled each other? Sarah asked after listening to the story to the end. Why? Because they really are similar. Oh God, I need to tell you so much. I don't even know where to start. You seem so agitated. Did something happen? Yes, something did. Just get ready to listen. 
it won't be easy. And know that there's no point in deceiving you. You're scaring me. Just tell me already. Victoria insisted. Remember our dinner together. Remember what I whispered in your ear. I remember, but we had a little argument afterward, and I forgot the word. Then I wanted to ask, but things got busy. All right, it's not crucial. Long story short, your husband came to our restaurant the next day. At first, he confronted me. He said that I was filling your head with empty nonsense. He said he no longer wanted our friendship. He ordered me. Yes, dear. He ordered me not to show up at your house anymore, not to call or message you. Can you imagine? I can't believe it. This can't be true. My Anderson. Yes, Victoria. Your Anderson. Of course, I sent him packing. Then my Brian stepped in. But Anderson threatened in addition that our restaurant was on the brink of collapse because of him. I thought he was just bluffing. But from the beginning of the week, various services started showing up at our place firefighters, police, health inspectors. They kept pestering us, nitpicking on every little thing. I'm already exhausted. Brian is furious. He also thinks that Anderson orchestrated this and unleashed everyone on us. But why? And how, Zara? Are you sure you're not confusing things? I can't believe any of this. Well, I understand your skepticism, but your Anderson eyes an abuser. Here, read this. Zara offered and handed over her phone. Victoria tentatively took Zara's smartphone in her hands and saw the very article about domestic abuse. She read it slowly, pondering over various phrases. And when she finished, she looked at her friend with a frightened expression. Zara, so you mean he doesn't love me? Is all of this untrue? She asked. Oh my God, Victoria, there is no love in this at all. You just caught his eye, like a beautiful painting or a porcelain figurine at a market, and he bought you. That's why he made you quit your job. That's why he fought with Kimberly, and now he's trying to quarrel with me. Do you know why he reminded you of your brother? Because he's just as much of a tyrant as he was in your childhood. You just don't notice it. You've become a puppet in his hands. He plays with you like a toy. He chooses your clothes, your hair kit. He even made you go to the gym based on his whim. Remember Louise? Remember her? Well, that's going to be you in three years. You'll be sitting at the table, afraid to open your mouth too much. Think about it. Victoria sat there, her face full of shock. Her friend felt sorry for her, but she couldn't find other words to open her eyes. They simply didn't exist. When Anderson sent inspectors to their restaurant, Zara herself was doubtful for a while. She thought maybe it was just a coincidence, but the last inspector clearly hinted that it wasn't just a random occurrence. They had crossed someone's path. Is that why you didn't call me for so many days? Victoria asked. I was afraid that your Anderson would find out and it would get worse. He even checks your phone. How do you know? Because I sent you that article that very evening and the next morning I checked your phone. You didn't respond at all, even though you were online the night before. Did you see my messages? No, definitely not. Oh God, what a nightmare. What do I do now? Run away from him, and that's not all. I found out something about your Adam. Do you remember him? Victoria remembered Adam very well. She had been in love with him once. They even planned to get married after finishing college, but then he left her without an explanation. Later. He disappeared from her life altogether. It was around that time that Anderson came into her life, so caring and attentive. He skillfully played on the strings of her wounded young soul. Remembering his words now, she began to realize that none of it was by chance. But recalling the past was difficult. Her life before marriage seemed like a fog, and even after marriage, too. Just don't tell me that he left me because of Anderson, she said her eyes wide with horror. When your Anderson came to us and threatened us, he mentioned quite ambiguously how easily he gets rid of your friends and lovers. I didn't understand it back then. I had already forgotten about Adam, but I remembered the next evening. I did some research. Did you know he was expelled from college? What? How could that have happened? Victoria asked in confusion. The dean himself expelled him. I decided to dig further. At that time, he had a student secretary. She was in our class. I found out her name and found her on social media. 
After a brief conversation, she remembered who Adam was and why he was expelled. She said the dean clearly received a bribe, a pretty large sum at that. Within a week, he upgraded his car, sold the old one, and got a much better new one. Although according to her, he had been complaining about not having enough money before that. What a nightmare, Poe Adam, I had no idea. But why didn't he come and tell me everything? He probably didn't have the chance. The day after they signed the order for his expulsion, the military draft office showed up at his place. They took him away right from the dorm. His parents only found out a week later that their son had been taken into the army. But he could have called me, her friend said with desperation in her voice. He could have, but think back to those days. How soon did you get your new phone? It took about two weeks after you started dating Anderson. He supposedly accidentally drowned it and then bought a new one to make up for it, and a new SIM card. And you are not much of a social media user, if you remember. How would he have found you? Although I wouldn't be surprised if Anderson was already monitoring your phone and cleaning up your messages back then. And Adam didn't call you. We didn't communicate much back then. He probably didn't even have my number. In short, this is still not all. What a nightmare. I'm already scared to hear more. All right, sweetheart, take my hands. Take a few deep breaths. Zara continued her story after waiting for her friend to calm down a bit. So, when he was supposed to go home, about a week before that, they sent him to chop wood in the forest, as if by accident. A tree fell on him there. He broke both legs. He spent a long time in the hospital. And then they sent him home to his mother, all broken. He came back home. He's still recovering. Victoria turned even paler. The thought that Adam had suffered so much because of her frightened her. It's my fault in everything. If it weren't for me, Victoria, snap out of it. Stop blaming yourself for everything under the sun. In this case, it's solely your Anderson's fault. Zara said loudly and confidently, trying to bring her back to reason and logic. Victoria vigorously shook her head in different directions. She wanted to cry, but the tears were stuck in her eyes. But suddenly she fell silent and asked, Wait, how do you know all of this? Did you talk to Adam? From the guilty expression on her friend's face, Victoria understood that that's exactly what had happened. Yes, I tracked him down, called him last night. He's still struggling, starting over from scratch with his studies. And you know, he told me that Anderson openly threatened him, demanded that he leave you, but he told Anderson off, and that's why he was punished so severely. Poor Adam, he didn't deserve this. Victoria, you'll become the one who's pitied soon if you stay with Anderson. Do you understand that? The young woman looked at her friend with fear in her eyes. She understood, but she still didn't know what to do next and how to untangle herself from this web. I understand, she said quietly. Just don't tell me, please, don't tell me that you're one of those foolish girls who'd be willing to endure a husband's abuse for the sake of money. Tell me that's not true, I'm begging you. Victoria felt a bit offended by those words. No, Zara, I'm not like that. I need to think carefully about what to do next. I can't even gather my thoughts right now. Run away from him, run away right now. Take your passport and go somewhere. Just selling that little ring on your finger will give you enough for a while. Let's say I do that. But what will happen to you and Brian? Do you really think Anderson will leave you alone? I highly doubt it. We need another plan. But I can't think right now. I need to cool down. Digest all of this. It's just a nightmare. Zara shook her head in frustration. She was afraid that if Victoria didn't escape right now, things would only get worse. But suddenly her friend looked up and gave her a strange look. In her eyes, there was a sort of crazed glint, as if she had gone mad from everything she had learned. Darling, are you okay? Zari asked, sounding concerned. Yes, I'll be fine, I promise you. And I'll try to make sure Anderson leaves you alone. I haven't figured out exactly how yet. Well, to be precise, I haven't fully pieced the puzzle together in my mind, but I will come up with something. I've already found starting points. Almost found them. You're scaring me a little. What are you planning? Just don't pick up anything heavy. You could get in trouble for that, Zara said, fearing that Victoria might have decided to harm her husband. No, absolutely not. 
I'm not that foolish, and I don't want to end up in jail. But you see, I won't forgive myself if I leave everything as it is. I need time to really think it through. Victoria didn't look great, but there was something in her eyes that made Zara believe her. Zara, you'd better go home or to the restaurant now. God forbid, Anderson Comey's unexpectedly and sees you. Don't call me for now, okay? I'll call you myself when I'm alone. Or I'll message you somewhere, so he won't find out about anything. I promise I'll try to fix everything. Victoria, don't worry about me right now. We'll figure something out. We'll manage. How? Adam couldn't manage. I dumped him when he needed me. I won't do that to you. Please, go. I need to focus. I need to feel all of this and understand. Zara agreed, and within a minute, she was on her way home. She really hoped that her friend would be all right. Although one hope seemed insufficient here. In any case, she had done everything she could for now. When Victoria was left alone, it took her a long time to gather herself. Thoughts were spinning in her head. Everything was mixed up. To sort it all out, she took her recipe notebook and started writing down everything that came to her mind. He lied to me. Anderson lied to me all this time. He doesn't love me and never loved me if he treated me this way. Why didn't I see this before? Why did I let go of Adam so easily? I loved him so much. All because of Anderson. What do I do next? First, I need to help Sarah. But how? Cunning is needed. What kind? I'll come up with something. I'll definitely come up with something. Maybe I need to sacrifice something. But I've already sacrificed so much my pride, my self-respect, love in vain. Can I sacrifice more and what with? Oh, I've got an idea. But I'll think about that later. Why me? Why didn't I realize for so long that Anderson was far from perfect? No, say it directly. He's the abuser from the article. Just a tyrant and dictator. But how did he manage it? How did he catch me? Oh yes, love. I was so starved for it, for as long as I can remember. But why did I believe him? How could I not see? Because I desperately needed love from childhood. But why? I need more information. After that sentence, Victoria turned on her laptop and started googling, reading a dozen articles about abusers and the reasons victims tolerate them. There was so much information. At some point, it felt like she was going crazy. After setting aside the laptop for a while, Victoria simply lay down on the couch and stared at the ceiling. For some reason, only one word echoed in her mind, mother. But what about her mother? What question was haunting her? What exactly did she want to achieve from her mother? Could her mother help? Unlikely. Victoria glanced at the clock and realized that Anderson would be back home in two hours. Dinner was still not ready. Time had flown by so quickly. At first, she wanted to brush everything aside and take action immediately, but she knew she wasn't ready yet. She didn't yet know how to stand up to her husband. She needed a little more time. She went to the kitchen and prepared dinner, changed into clean clothes, aired out the apartment and began to wait for him. As she evaluated her actions now, she began to understand that she was behaving like the textbook victim of an abuser. Even the tiniest details, like a corner of the bedsheet turned down on their bed, could send Anderson into a fit of rage. It had happened before. So, before he arrived, Victoria had to run through the entire apartment, making sure everything was in its place and in perfect order. And she had been doing this for many months in a row. But why had he really managed to break her down to this extent? How did he do it? She hadn't been like this before, or had she? Desperate thoughts were swirling around in her head. While waiting for her husband, Victoria tried to understand what exactly she was so afraid of, always striving to please him. She attempted to draw parallels with her brother, but her mind kept echoing only one word mother. Anderson returned home at 10, just as he had promised. Victoria went to open the door for him, desperately trying to pretend that nothing had changed between them. He was different that evening. The day before, Anderson had decided to have drinks with his friends, who were also his business partners Clinton and Carl. They had been together since university days, building their business from scratch. You're late today, she said with a forced smile. Yes, darling, I'm late, and I'm very hungry. Set the table. Did they get you drunk but didn't feed you? She inquired. 
Don't babble, woman, set the table, I'm telling you. Victoria felt like her husband wasn't just drunk. It seemed he had taken something else or smoked something, considering how intensely he craved food. She obediently went to the kitchen and prepared everything exactly as he liked. Every plate had to be in its place, just like other objects. It took her a while to learn her husband's quirks. In the past, it had caused many disagreements. As she set the table, Victoria reminisced about all of this, but with entirely different emotions now. Before, her blind love for her husband and the desire to be his beloved had driven her actions, but now, so much had changed. When Anderson entered the kitchen, he seemed slightly calmer. After surveying the table, he smiled contentedly and sat down to eat. Bon appetit, Victoria said and was about to leave the kitchen. Wait, where are you going? Aren't you going to eat? He asked. I've already eaten. I told you, you're late today. She lied, unable to think about food today. By the way, I've been solving problems that arose because of my beloved wifey. Anderson exclaimed indignantly. Victoria became intrigued by this statement. At first, she hesitated to ask, but curiosity overpowered her. What kind of problems, darling? No need to clutter your lovely little head with them. I've already sorted everything out. The issue is resolved. From his tone and expression, Victoria deduced that he was talking about Zara and Brian. She couldn't afford to delay. Anderson, I talked to Zara today. She cautiously began. He almost choked upon hearing this. Why did you talk to her? Weren't we supposed to be done with those pitiful little people? He practically yelled. For a moment, Victoria was frightened, but then she gathered herself. Anderson, she told me everything. What did she tell you? He asked with a predatory grin. She told me that you had sent inspectors to their restaurant. And so what? Are you not satisfied? I'm trying for us. How else was I supposed to get rid of that trash around my beloved wifey? Anderson, can you stop? If I promise that I won't talk to Zero anymore, will you stop? She asked with hope in her voice. Anderson let out a satisfied chuckle. He didn't expect her to weaken her stance so quickly. The first friend had been more difficult. He had spent several weeks trying to distance her from his wife. Fine, but where are the guarantees? Isn't my word enough for you? What guarantees do you need? You'll delete her phone number, block her on all messengers and social media. Do we have a deal? I agree with everything. Just don't harm them, please, she pleaded. No problem. I don't care about them. You're the only one who matters to me, darling. Don't you understand that? Come here, I'll hug you. You've pleased me a lot. Victoria obediently walked over and settled onto his lap. He kissed her neck and smelled her hair. He did that often. He enjoyed it. Anderson, please cancel everything right now. I'm begging you. Bring me the phone, he commanded, and in a flash, Victoria rushed to the bedroom and brought it to him. Anderson dialed Clinton's number and put the call on speaker. When the ringing stopped and Clinton answered, he said, Clinton, it's all canceled. You mean the restaurant? Are you serious? The fun is just beginning. Clinton, I repeat, he said more sternly, it's all canceled. All right, as you say, are you sure? I'm sure, cancel everything right now. Fine, goodbye, Clinton said discontentedly and hung up. Victoria hoped that he wouldn't dare defy her husband. And why would he even need to? While her husband turned away, Victoria smiled in relief. She managed to avert one disaster. Her phone was in her pocket. She took it out and, as promised, removed her friend from her life as if she had never existed. He even made her delete the photos with her, erasing all traces but Victoria was prepared to do that. This was the necessary sacrifice, at least for now. Most of all, Victoria was afraid that after dinner, her husband would start pestering her. Or rather, she feared that she wouldn't be able to hide her disgust for him when it happened. To her relief, after dinner, Anderson barely made it to the bed and fell asleep as soon as his head touched the pillow. Watching him sleep peacefully, Horrifying thoughts entered Victoria's mind, thoughts that made her feel ashamed and terrified. Most of all, she feared that if push came to shove, she might turn her thoughts into real actions. The next morning, Anderson woke up as if nothing had happened. 
as if they had been discussing a future celebration yesterday and not the loss of her best friend. Now Victoria could clearly see who stood before her, but strangely, she didn't feel fear, at least not for herself. When her husband left for work, Victoria turned on her laptop again. She couldn't figure out what to do next. Simply run away. No, that was definitely not an option. It was too early. She decided to read a few more articles about abuse, but when she entered the search query, the first thing she saw was a browser ad. Psychologist. First consultation free. That was exactly what she desperately needed right now. Madeline's office, the psychologist, was located nearby, not far from her fitness center, in the adjacent building. Victoria made the call and arranged a meeting. To her great joy, Madeline agreed to see her the same day. Dressed as if she were heading to a workout, she drove there. On the way, she called her husband as usual and reported her movements. To keep him from worrying that's how he used to justify his desire to control her every step before. For now, she couldn't refuse the rules of the game he had initiated. Victoria knew that for the next two hours, her husband wouldn't bother her. After all, she never took her phone to the gym. She also knew that sometimes he tracked her movements through a certain app on his smartphone. So everything had to be crystal clear. She entered the fitness center, left her things in the locker room, and then discreetly exited through the back entrance. She knew where he was. Victoria knocked on Madeline's office door almost on the dot. She had only an hour to find at least some answers to her questions, and she had quite a few of them. The room was dimly lit. The blinds shielded them from the outside world. Only a small floor lamp illuminated the space. After a quick glance around, Victoria mustered the courage to start the conversation. Madeline, I have a problem. Or rather, I'm in trouble. My husband is a true abuser. I only realized this recently, and I need your help. Victoria, why did you conclude that your husband is an abuser, and what do you understand by that term? She asked. Madeline, I fully understand that you might doubt my words and convictions, but we only have an hour. I really need your help. I promise I'll sign up for therapy with you. I need it, but right now, I need you to answer a few of my questions. Are you willing? The psychologist understood that it would be better to indulge the young woman for now, in order to secure a solid client in the future. After all, issues of abuse aren't easily resolved. Therapy can last for months or even years. All right, just try to formulate your questions correctly, and I'll do my best to answer them. In a very concise manner, without delving into unnecessary details, Victoria recounted her mother and brother's situation. She spoke about how she longed for her mother's love in her childhood, how desperately she tried to earn it. The narrative smoothly shifted to her tyrant of a husband. She described her behavior so the specialist could understand that she wasn't mistaken. She managed to cover it all in 20 minutes. She was even surprised herself by how skillfully she was able to articulate her thoughts. So, here are my questions. How can I break free from emotional dependency? What should I do? A straightforward method. That's the first one. The second, how do I learn to stand up to him? And the third, how do I leave without my close friend suffering? All right, I'll try to help you, but you must listen carefully and not interrupt me. Agreed? Of course, Victoria agreed to listen and absorb every word. She nodded obediently, anticipating that she would finally find out what to do next. Madeline paused for about a minute. She needed to collect her thoughts too. The situation was delicate. Your first question, emotional dependency. Before you can overcome it, you need to understand which specific emotions he's feeding off of in you. Once you figure that out, you'll be able to resist it. Usually, it's fear or guilt. But in your case, it's more likely guilt. And he's been feeling your vulnerability with his claims of genuine love. Victoria nodded. She had already managed to deduce that much about love and manipulation. Your second question stems from the first standing up to him. This one's trickier. You see, people often become entwined with abusers unconsciously, but there are specific reasons hidden in their subconscious mind. It's like an unfinished movie, an inadequately developed trauma script. In your case, it's your relationship with your mother. She adeptly manipulated you, it seems, during your childhood, using the same tool the feeling of guilt. 
Perhaps you fell for your husband precisely because you couldn't resolve the emotions you had towards your mother. And I fear that before you can stand up to your husband, you need to address the issue with your mother. It's harder than it seems. Can I ask a question? Not for now. We agreed on that. But you'll have more questions later. There's time. Madeline responded politely, then continued. The third question is the most challenging. How to leave? If you want to escape him with minimal losses, I'm afraid you need an ace up your sleeve. People like your husband understand only strength and power. He won't just let you go easily. But if you find a way to diminish his fervor, you can not only leave without losses, but also gain an advantage from it. Madeline sighed deeply, carefully studying the young woman sitting in front of her. There was hope in her eyes. Now you can ask your questions. Victoria pondered. She needed to phrase everything correctly. How can I address the issue with my mother? Cognitive therapy works well for that. I practice it and can help. But it's not a quick process. Madeline, you seem to have misunderstood me. I'm willing to work with you. I'll have to piece myself back together anyway. But a bit later, right now, I need decisive measures. Do you understand? Victoria, I'm afraid it might get worse if you act abruptly and without careful thought. I'm willing to try. Please, give me a starting point, she pleaded. Madeline shook her head disapprovingly. She didn't endorse such methods, but you need to meet your mother and straightforwardly ask her why she didn't love you all these years. Her answer will likely be unpleasant. It might hurt and be offensive, but upon hearing the response, you must draw certain conclusions for yourself. What conclusions? I don't know yet. I've never met your mother, and I don't know the reason for her lack of love for her own daughter. Do you understand? But I'll ask you, if you go and talk to her face to face, call me afterward if you need to discuss it, or come by. I'm afraid it's more complex than you might imagine. She thanked the psychologist for the answers and promised that she would call soon and sign up for therapy. And she wasn't lying. She genuinely wanted to understand everything thoroughly so that she would never encounter someone like Anderson again in her life. As a final request, Victoria asked, Excuse me, but could I use your phone for just a few seconds? Madeline was surprised by such a request, but she didn't object. While Victoria had deleted Zara's number, she hadn't forgotten it. She knew the emergency numbers by heart. Even Adam's number was still in her memory. Hello, Zara, it's me. Victoria, whose number is this? It doesn't matter. I might need your help soon. Also, I think I've resolved the issue with your business, but I promised Anderson that we won't communicate anymore. Never. Don't call me. I'll find a way to reach out. Oh my God. Are you okay? Yes, everything's fine. Will you help? Of course. I'll be waiting for your message. Victoria hung up and thanked Madeline for the phone. She glanced at the clock and realized their time was up. As a final note, she only asked, I'm not to blame for him becoming like this, am I? No, Victoria. He was like this before he met you. You're not to blame for anything. After the conversation with the psychologist, Victoria returned to the fitness center, retrieved her belongings, and headed home. When she arrived, Anderson was home. He was sitting with his laptop, reviewing some reports. Hey, darling, you're home, she said, entering the living room. Hey, sweetie, as you can see, were you at the gym? Yes, just got back. You're such a clever one. Come here, let me kiss you. I'm so proud of you, Anderson hurriedly said. Victoria obediently approached and kissed her husband, then sat down next to him and peered at the laptop. There were some financial documents there. Understanding them at first glance was tough, but her husband seemed preoccupied. Something that rarely happened. Don't peek, he said sharply, pushing the laptop away. Oh, come on, I don't understand any of it anyway, she said with a smile. You're the smart one here. From his reaction, she guessed that the documents were important. They were on a flash drive. Suddenly, Anderson unexpectedly received a call and went to the kitchen so that she wouldn't hear the conversation. Victoria was terribly frightened but she realized there might not be another opportunity. She quickly copied the flash drive's data onto a disk in a folder with photos from a year ago. When everything was ready, she put the laptop back in its place and stepped aside, acting as if nothing had happened. 
She didn't yet know if there was anything valuable for her on the drive, but she didn't have any other cards to play for now. She had to start somewhere. When Anderson returned to the living room, he looked troubled. Dowling, I'll need to leave for a couple of days. Issues at one of our branches require my intervention. Will you miss me? Of course, dear. I'll miss you very much, Victoria openly lied, trying to hide her joy in her eyes. And will you behave yourself? I promise, she obediently said. Should I pack your things? Yes, just quickly. Put a few clean shirts and a couple of sets of underwear in a bag. Victoria went to the bedroom and quickly prepared everything. Her hands were trembling with fear. She worried that he might accidentally notice that the files from the flash drive had been copied to the laptop, and then she'd have a lot to explain. Luckily, that didn't happen. Just 15 minutes later, Anderson got into his car and left. He promised to call more often but said he would be very busy in the near future. Victoria looked at the clock. It was getting closer to evening. Planning something for today would be foolish. She might not have enough time. So, she decided to delve into what she had copied from the flash drive for now. She turned on the laptop, found the folder, and opened it. The knowledge she had gained at the Business Institute was proving to be very useful now. She understood that these were sales documents, but couldn't figure out what was wrong with them. Somehow, she felt that they would help her in the future. She copied the data from the folder onto her own flash drive and headed to Zara's place. Her husband was better at dealing with these matters. Zara was eagerly waiting for her friend with her laptop already turned on. After a few minutes of studying the documents, Brian gave his verdict. Kickbacks. Seriously, Victoria asked. Can you explain in more detail? He was embezzling from his own company and partners, and he'd been doing it for Kite some time. With every deal, he received kickbacks into his personal account. Can these documents confirm that? Zero inquired. Easily, if they end up in the right hands. He could even be jailed for fraud and tax evasion. Victoria smiled contentedly. She now had an ace up her sleeve. Brian continued to study the documents while the girls went to grab a snack. Victoria finally had an appetite. She hadn't eaten much for a couple of days, so Zara suggested they have dinner together. Soon, Brian joined them in the kitchen with a satisfied expression. There's something else there, something very interesting. What else? The friends asked in unison. In one file, there's complete access to his personal account where he transferred the stolen money. If desired, the funds can be transferred to another account. You'd only need an SMS from his phone to confirm the transaction. A small plan had already formed in Victoria's mind. But how could she execute it? And now, she faced another equally challenging task. One that could only be accomplished while Anderson was out of town. Zara, do you remember I asked you for help? She asked her friend. Of course, what have you come up with? As Zara replied. I need to visit my hometown and see my mother. Could you come with me? Sure. Zara confidently said. Do you want me to go with you to see her? No, I'm just not sure if I'll be able to drive back calmly, so I need you. I don't have anyone else to ask. Zara agreed, of course. They decided to leave early the next morning. Victoria went home to calm down, think, and pack the necessary things for the trip. Victoria hardly slept the entire night. Her mind was full of thoughts that wouldn't let her rest. But by morning, she clearly understood why she needed to see her mother. She needed answers, or rather, not just needed, but urgently required them to regain her footing in life. Exactly at six in the morning, Zara picked her up. They decided to take Zara's car. It was faster and more comfortable. How are you? Zara asked, noticing the red eyes from lack of sleep. Fine, do you want me to drive? It's about a three-hour drive. Sure, let's do that in half an hour. When you've woken up a bit, you don't look too good. Okay, let's make it in half an hour, Victoria agreed. She looked somewhat detached, as if she were heading towards some kind of sacrifice. But it wasn't surprising. Zara couldn't quite understand why now. The visit to her mother could have been postponed. Victoria, are you sure you need this right now? You already have a lot of problems, and you're deciding to delve into the past. It might make things worse. Zara, there's nowhere worse to go. But I really need this. I'm not expecting joyful hugs and warm words. 
I know it won't be easy, but there's something I need to understand for myself. What exactly? I'll explain to you when we're on our way back. Please turn on some music. I need a little distraction. They drove for another half hour with the radio playing and then switched places. Victoria looked better now and her friend agreed to let her take the wheel. Victoria kept glancing at the time as if she were waiting for something. Why do you keep looking at your watch? Azari asked. At 7.30, Anderson will call. Her friend calmly replied. Why at 7.30? Are you sure? Have you figured out what you'll say to him? He always calls at this time when he's on a business trip. Probably to make sure I don't get enough sleep, even when he's not home. Victoria sadly answered. They were passing through a small town and decided to stop for coffee at a gas station when Victoria's phone rang. Hello, dear, good morning to you, came the voice from the other end of the invisible line. Good morning, honey, is everything okay over there? Victoria replied. Yay, well, not really. Where are you? Her husband asked in a more serious tone. Anderson had a free minute in the morning and decided to check if his wife was at home. However, the app showed that she was somewhere unknown, so he decided to call her. I'm on my way to my mom's. She called and said she's feeling sick and asked me to come over. Victoria almost lied. Seriously, but you said you don't have any communication with her at all. I'm not some kind of monster. She's still my mother. I should help her. You yourself said that family is sacred, remember? I remember, but why didn't you tell me anything? Don't you understand that you should inform me about such things? You should have waited for me so we could go together. It's not safe to travel alone like this. What if something happens on the road? Anderson, what could happen to me? The car is in good condition. I know where I'm going. I'll be back today. I'll get the medications from the pharmacy and call a doctor if necessary. I'll be back by the evening. Don't worry about me. And I'm sorry I didn't tell you. I didn't want to trouble you. You already have your own problems. Okay, keep me updated. I'll call you every hour and distract you while driving. That will certainly lead to something happening. I'd rather call you when I arrive, okay? Fine, but don't forget. Otherwise, I'll be mad. Anderson didn't like that his wife had gone so far without telling him, but he chose to believe her. After all, what else could he do? When the call ended, Zara couldn't hold back her questions. Why did you tell him where you're going? He would have found out anyway, sooner or later. He keeps an eye on me. It's better to tell a part of the truth so as not to raise suspicion. Besides, I'm not doing anything criminal. At least not yet. What do you mean not yet? I have an idea. About your mom, uh, her friend asked in confusion. No, of course not. It's about Anderson. It was half past 10 in the morning when the girls entered the small town where Victoria's childhood had passed. She looked anxious, even a little frightened, but she held herself confidently. Are you really sure you don't want me to come with you? Zara asked. Yes, I'm sure. I can handle it. Don't worry, Victoria replied. She got out of the car and entered her building. She was certain her mother was at home and she was right. When her mother opened the door, she was surprised but not pleased. Well, hello there, my dear daughter. Remember where your home is located. Finally, her mother greeted her with displeasure. Hello, mommy. I'm also thrilled to see you. Her daughter replied ironically. How have you been? Is everything great? How have you been getting by? If you need money, I can't help. You know, there's not much extra. I don't need money. I want to talk. Can you help me with that? And I wouldn't mind some tea. I traveled a long way to get here. Tea is available. Let's go to the kitchen. Her mother said coldly. Margaret made tea for herself and her daughter. It seemed that she was completely indifferent, or even uncomfortable in Victoria's presence, as if she wanted her daughter to leave her house as soon as possible. Well, ask your question. What did you want to ask? Her mother began. Victoria looked intently at her mother and asked directly, can you answer me honestly, at least once in your life? Of course, I can, but I haven't heard the question yet. At that moment, Victoria seemed to feel like that little and perpetually hurt girl who had tried with all her might, but in vain, to earn her mother's love. Mom, why didn't you love me all these years? What did I do to you? She asked without preamble. 
Margaret wasn't even surprised by such a question. She didn't try to deny or justify herself. It was as if she, to some extent, had been expecting that this conversation would take place sooner or later. You see, because of you, your father left me. I loved him with all my heart. I thought we would grow old together and die on the same day. But when you were born, everything changed. He fell out of love with me, and then he left for a younger woman. After Margaret's second childbirth, she gained a lot of weight. Her husband didn't want to be around a woman who didn't care about her figure. Moreover, she had numerous demands that seemed to have no end. They often argued, quarreled without reason. Victoria couldn't remember all of that. She was too young, but her mother remembered everything. Mom, what does that have to do with me? Victoria asked. If I hadn't given birth to you, I wouldn't have gained so much weight. I would have remained young and beautiful. Mom, no one forced you to have me. Are you saying it's all my fault? Margaret protested. Apparently, yes. Instead of trying to solve your problems, you projected all your resentment onto me. Do you even understand how awful it is to be hated by your own mother? You should have just sent me to an orphanage. What were you complaining about? You had a roof over your head, food, clothing, everything a child needs. I didn't have the most important things, a sense of security and maternal love. Somehow, you didn't stop loving Jack when dad left because Jack was your father's favorite. When our son was born, my husband adored him and you. If it weren't for you, we would still be together. Mom, are you out of your mind? Do you realize you ruined my whole life? How did I ruin it? I talked to Jack recently and he told me everything. You're married and happy. Your husband is a decent man. He provides for you, buys you everything. Mom, my husband is a tyrant. He's abused me so much that I nearly became a vegetable. And by the way, Jack's wife is exactly the same. She's also pregnant. I'm afraid it's only going to get worse. How dare you blame your brother for everything? He has a great family. His wife is smart and beautiful. They came to visit a couple of weeks ago and they told me they're expecting. I'm so happy for them. Have you seen Louise? She's timid, gray mouse, afraid to say a word out of place. She's an obedient wife. That's what Jack needs, and you can't figure anything out in life. The escalating conversation was wearing on Victoria. She had received her answers. Her mother didn't love her because she believed her father left their family because of her. It was strange that she hadn't realized this sooner. To her, there seemed to be some kind of secret in their family that she didn't know about. She couldn't believe that everything was so simple and obvious. In the end, Victoria decided to reveal a terrible secret to her mother, one she would never admit to herself. Mom, Dad left the family and not because of me. He left you because you were a bitter, overweight woman who only dreamed of getting married to have a man take care of you while you chat away. We won't see each other anymore. Get by. I no longer have a mother. Margaret was stunned, her mouth agape in surprise. Victoria stared at her hoping to see a hint of remorse and rise, but there was only antipathy. As her friend exited the building, Azara noticed her paleness. She stepped out of the car and hugged Victoria. It was clear that the conversation had been far from easy. She seated her friend in the car to quickly get her away from that horrible place. They drove in silence for a few minutes, but then Zara couldn't hold back and asked, did you find your answers? What's next? Victoria looked at her friend. It seemed there was relief or something similar in her eyes. Her heart was still heavy. Her hands were trembling, but it was getting easier with each passing minute. She absentmindedly stared at the road. The landscape was changing rapidly. It was coming. Victoria remained quiet for a little while longer, trying to gather her thoughts, and then answered, My mother hated me not because I was terrible, but because she was terrible. She said my father left because of me. But that's not how it works. All these years, I thought I was bad and that's why my mother didn't love me. At some point, I let that go when I left home and didn't even call. But apparently, I need to confront my problems, not hide from them. Do you think Anderson is your punishment? Zara asked uncertainly. No, not a punishment. 
just a consequence of me hiding behind my resentment toward my mother. I wanted her love and love in general so much that I willingly accepted Anderson's love. I was hovering around him like on wings at first. I loved him so much that I stopped noticing everything around me. He became the center of my universe. And now, and now I'm finally ready to grow up. I understand it won't be easy, but it's necessary. It's time to stop being a little hurt girl. Zara looked at her friend skeptically. She didn't fully grasp what Victoria meant. Just don't tell me you're planning to change him. Do you want to stay with him? Oh my God, of course not. Anderson is almost in the past. I just need to avoid making mistakes to come out of this unscathed. Phew, I was worried there for a moment. Victoria understood what her friend had been thinking. She was even surprised at her suspicions. No, Zara, Anderson will never change. He's not really that awful, just too focused on himself and his desires. But he's not the right fit for me anymore. What are you going to do? Maybe you shouldn't go back home. No, I need to return for now. If I want to start a new life, I'll need money, and now I know where to get it. Do you think Brian, your Brian, would agree to help? I think so, but I won't vouch for him. Do you have a plan already? Yes, just need to work out the details to make it all come together, and I need to call my husband to let him know not to worry, Victoria said with a smile, as if he were right beside her. Three hours later, they were approaching Zara and Brian's home. Victoria explained her plan. Brian didn't need much, but it was still risky. They just had to wait for Anderson's return from his business trip. Once Victoria was alone, she felt a strong urge to call Madeline and ask something. The psychologist answered almost immediately. Hello, did you do it? And Madeline asked. Victoria let out a relieved sigh and said, yes, and I'm glad. What did it give you? What did your mother say? She told the psychologist the condensed version of the story. Madeline listened, not surprised. She had suspected something like this. I get it. I finally understood that I wasn't to blame. I spent my whole childhood feeling guilty. I got so used to it that I couldn't think otherwise. I'm really happy for you, but you understand this isn't enough, right? You still have a long journey ahead to work through your issues. Yes, I understand, and I'm glad we met. I hope you'll help me. I'll definitely call soon to schedule therapy, but right now, I have one question for you. Can I? Of course, I have 15 minutes before my next client. Madeline, is it normal that I occasionally catch myself thinking that I still love my husband and don't want to lose him? I mean, I know he took advantage of my weaknesses, that he's a domestic tyrant, and yet I still feel something for him. Victoria, in your case, these emotions are quite normal. You can't stop loving someone in just a few days, especially an abuser. That's why therapy is needed to get rid of these emotions once and for all. It's not easy, but it's possible, and I'll help you. Have you talked to your husband? What are your plans? No, he's still on his business trip. Once he's back, I'll tell him that we're getting a divorce. It's frightening to think about what will happen. Do you have a plan already? Have you thought about your escape routes and ensuring your safety? I have a plan, but I'm still thinking about the safety guarantee. Madeline paused for a second and then offered Victoria an interesting idea to remain unharmed after the conversation with her husband. The idea seemed genuinely good, so Victoria agreed. Within a few minutes, she had sent an email to the psychologist. Anderson arrived two days later. He was visibly angry and displeased as he entered the apartment. Victoria noticed it immediately, but initially didn't pay much attention. You lied to me, he exclaimed from the doorway. What are you talking about? Or his wife inquired. And hello to you too, dear. I finally managed to get in touch with your brother. He said your mother is fine. She never even thought of being sick. Victoria fell silent for a moment. She had suspected something like this could happen but she was prepared. Seems like he hasn't talked to her in a while. She was feeling unwell. I even called an ambulance for her. Her blood pressure had spiked, but she's fine now. Why should I believe you? Anderson persisted. Sweetheart, you've just come off the road and you're tired. I've run you a hot bath. How about you take it and then you can calmly tell me how the business trip went to Victoria calmly suggested. 
She softly turned on some music so that he could relax and also not overhear anything. She poured a glass of whiskey, added two ice cubes as he liked, and headed towards the bathroom. Anderson took a big sip and leaned back against the tub. I might pour myself a glass of wine too. You don't mind, do you? She asked with a gentle smile. Of course not, and hurried back. Exiting the bathroom, she made her way directly to the bedroom. She knew Anderson's phone password and easily unlocked it. Using his phone, she quickly called Brian. He picked up, subtly indicating he was ready. Within seconds, a confirmation code for a transaction arrived on her husband's phone. Victoria jotted down the numbers and sent the message to Zara. She then promptly deleted the messages from both phones, as if nothing had happened. The whole process took less than a minute. Victoria breathed a sigh of relief and headed to the kitchen for a glass of wine. She felt like celebrating. How's it going? Did you sort everything out? She asked upon entering the bathroom. Victoria looked different, but Anderson didn't notice. Since when did you become interested in my affairs? Anderson asked. I just wanted to keep the conversation going, that's all. Don't you have anything else to tell me? He rudely asked. Actually, I do. And it's going to be a serious conversation. I spoke with my mother, and I've come to some realizations. Anderson became intrigued. And then what? She broke me. She made me vulnerable. She never loved me. Victoria spoke slowly, as if stretching a rubber band. And you took advantage of that. What are you trying to say with this? I'm saying that we're getting a divorce. Anderson nearly choked on his whiskey. It was as if she had timed her statement to coincide with a sip. An almost predatory expression crossed his face, sending a shiver down Victoria's spine. Say that again. He demanded. Anderson, we're getting a divorce. Are you out of your mind? I'm gone for a few days, and during that time, did your brain evaporate? What kind of divorce? He asked, quickly getting out of the tub and reaching for a towel to dry off. Victoria seized the opportunity and left the bathroom. She headed to the kitchen and took a seat in a distant corner, as if trying to hide from him. Zara had strongly advised her not to engage in an open confrontation with her husband, but her friend hadn't listened. When Anderson entered the kitchen, he was furious, but surprisingly, Victoria remained calm. Dowling, are you sure you're not mixing things up? I won't let you divorce me. He almost hissed. Of course you will. We don't have children, and we don't share any property. I'm not your possession, even though you seem to have forgotten that. Victoria, you're mine. Whether you like it or not, you're mine, and you'll stay mine. No, darling, I'm no longer yours. It's over between us. For a moment, Anderson stared at her as if he could kill with his gaze. But suddenly, he appeared to become comma. He poured himself another glass of whiskey and sat across from his wife. Fine, sweetheart. Now, how about you tell me what happened, and in detail. We'll sort everything out together like normal people, he suggested. Victoria understood that this was merely a game from his side, but she also knew she had to explain everything to finally break free from him. Anderson, you're an abuser, and you know it. I lived in a fog for a long time, but finally, I realized everything. He clenched the glass tighter in his hand. It seemed like it could shatter any moment. A vein near his temple began to pulse on his face, but he continued to appear calm. Darling, are you getting caught up in some internet nonsense? It's a common topic these days, but it's not about us. I just love you and want you to be safe. Maybe sometimes I go overboard, but you know, everyone has their flaws. Love should endure, no matter what. Victoria had often heard something like this from him, but now the noodles smoothly slid off her ears and didn't stick. No, Anderson, it's not just a flaw, and it's definitely not love. When you love someone, you accept them as they are, not try to change and mold them to fit you. You never loved me, Anderson. You don't even know me. You're mistaken, dear. I know you better than anyone else in this world and I only wish you well. How can you understand that? Ne'er sure, only your methods are strange. You made me quit my job, prohibited me from hanging out with my friends. You tried to ruin my friends' businesses. You even sent my boyfriend off to the army. Anderson squinted. He hadn't expected this, 
And how did she find out about all of this? Nonsense. I never did anything to your ex. No, I found out about everything. I just don't understand one thing. Do you even realize what you've done? You've ruined people's lives, Anderson. And why? Because they cared about me. Is that your version of caring? Victoria, you've lived with me all these years and wanted for nothing. Isn't that caring? I did everything for your happiness and lied to your own partners for my happiness too. Victoria asked with a satisfied smile. What are you talking about now? I've never deceived my partners. Where are you getting this from? About the kickbacks. I know about them, she replied, her smile growing wider. Where did you get those words? Her husband asked angrily. Victoria, you need to think carefully about what you're saying right now. You're stepping onto a slippery slope and you might fall. You might even break your neck, he said threateningly. Victoria continued to sit in her place, sipping her wine. She stared intently at her husband, but it wasn't the gaze of a meek lamb anymore. It was more like that of a predator. I covered my bases. If, God forbid, something happens to me, documents proving your schemes will end up in the right hands. Anderson got up from his seat and started to approach her, but then he heard her say, Step back and don't come any closer. I wouldn't advise you to pick a fight with me right now. Step back, she repeated loudly. Anderson hesitated and sat back down on his chair. And how can I be sure that if I let you go, you won't hand those documents over to anyone? And where did you get them? He decided to probe. The documents were on your flash drive, remember, and there's no reason for me to give them to anyone if you do as I want. For a moment, Victorian even felt like they had switched places, as if she had become the tyrant and he the victim. And it wasn't a pleasant sensation. And what do you expect from a divorce? You know we have nothing to divide. I don't need anything from you. I've already taken everything I wanted. What are you talking about? Anderson asked, not realizing what she meant. He thought she might have hidden the jewelry he gave her, or something else valuable. But what? I'm talking about your secret account. Don't believe me. Check your phone. Anderson jumped up from his chair. He couldn't even imagine that she would dare to do something like this. He went to the room, took his phone, checked the balance of that account, and saw only $6 left. Victoria knew her husband couldn't stand the number six, so she specifically asked Brian to leave exactly that amount in the account. It was as if the remaining balance was attracting misfortune. Have you lost your mind? There were over $60,000 there. That's theft. How could you? And how could you steal from your friends for so many years? I'm more like Robin Hood. I steal from those who steal from others. I promise to use some of the money for charity, just so it's like in that story, Victorian said with a smirk. Dear, if you want a divorce, then you'll give me back that money right now, or I won't be responsible for what happens next. That was my emergency fund for a worst-case scenario. And now you don't have it anymore, his wife replied. Anderson paced around the room like a trapped animal, trying to figure out how to appease his infuriated wife. Do you realize what will happen to your friends or your family when you leave? He asked angrily. Victoria smiled again, her smile starting to annoy him. If you touch any of my friends, I'll send the documents to your partners. And if you try to harm my family, I'll be grateful to you. I don't have a mother or a brother anymore. I'm leaving behind my sad past and starting a new life. Are you so sure you'll get away from here? He snidely asked. Absolutely. You love yourself too much to end up in prison. I have no doubt about that. Victoria was sure he wouldn't do anything to her. While Anderson was a skilled manipulator and swindler, he certainly wasn't a gangster or, even less, a murderer. Otherwise, he wouldn't have spared Adam. Get out of here. Leave right now. She stood up from the chair and made a little curtsy, which infuriated her husband even more. I'll just gather my things now. There's nothing of yours here. Get out. I'll take the documents and that's it. Don't worry. I have enough money for a new wardrobe. She took off her engagement ring, placed it on the kitchen table, and asked, Will you file for divorce yourself, or should I take care of it? File it yourself. I don't want to divorce you. I love you. 
I love you even after everything you've done. He almost shouted, how wonderful that it no longer affects me. Victoria convincingly lied. In reality, all of this affected her very much. For over two years, she had loved this man. She knew every little detail of his face and body. They had spent hundreds of wonderful nights together. Even now, she sometimes wanted to embrace him and comfort him, but she had to restrain herself. Victoria scolded herself for her feelings towards her almost ex-husband, but there was nothing she could do about it. Apparently, he had more power over her than she thought. She had to keep herself under control every second. The attacker's position helped her focus and not show weakness. She went to their bedroom, took the documents and cosmetics, threw a few panties and a pair of socks into her bag, changed clothes, and was ready to leave. As Victoria was putting on her sneakers, Anderson approached her from behind. He wanted to hug her, but she skillfully evaded. Then he got down on his knees in front of her and said, I'm begging you, don't leave me, I love you. Victoria had expected such a dramatic performance. She had never seen so much pain in his eyes before. For a moment, she felt sorry for both him and herself. Seeing this in her gaze, Anderson launched another attack. Victoria, you are my love, he said, still on his knees. I implore you, don't walk away from me. I'll die without you. I can't see a life without you. All my future, my plans, my dreams, they're all empty without you. Please, stay. We'll overcome everything. Together, I promise you. Victoria tried to compose herself, even though it was hard to watch all of this. Stop putting on a circus, enough. I don't believe you, she said angrily. She was so beautiful when she was angry. Anderson had never seen her this enraged before. She had always been gentle and sweet, but now, the anger in her eyes made his blood boil. I'm kneeling before you, can't you see it? No other woman deserves this, only you. I'll change, I promise you. I'll never hurt you again. Don't go. How she wished she could believe that. At that moment, she wanted more than anything in the world for it to be possible. But it wasn't like that. She closed her eyes and took a deep breath to bring herself back to her senses. Anderson, you'll never change. And even if you do, it won't be for my sake. Seems like you've followed in your father's footsteps. And that was your choice. Just like I've made mine. I won't live with a dictator. It's over between us. Saying this, she quickly left the apartment and closed the door behind her. She couldn't control her emotions any longer. Tears betrayed her as they streamed down her cheeks while she rushed down the stairs. Anderson remained on his knees, staring at the closing door. He still couldn't grasp that this was really happening. Darren, Anderson's father, always said that a wife should be submissive and obey her husband in everything. He often beat his mother if she showed any character or just for preventive measures. His sons witnessed it all, but they couldn't intervene or else they'd get the same treatment. With the years, they grew so accustomed to it that they stopped paying attention. As they say, a child absorbs what happens in the family. Seeing his mother suffer after his father's beatings, Anderson decided that he would never lay a hand on his wife, but he agreed with his father that she should be obedient. He saw how dutifully his mother managed the household. She ensured everyone was fed and content. He liked his life and his family. Everything seemed like it should be exactly this way and no other way. When he met Victoria, she immediately caught his eye. She was quiet and calm, the complete opposite of his ex. She had such a pure gaze that he couldn't resist. He made up his mind to win her over at any cost. And just when it seemed like he had succeeded, when he had tamed her and turned her into an almost perfect wife, all of this happened. He still couldn't understand where he had gone wrong. Why hadn't he managed to handle it? The facts spoke for themselves, she left. Victoria wanted a divorce. Somewhere in his troubled mind, he was sure that he truly loved her. He believed he took care of her, trying to make her obedient and quiet, just as a wife should be. Maybe he was afraid that he wouldn't be able to control himself again, so he tried to eliminate any conflict in their family. Anderson hadn't even realized that his script of marriage was initially spoiled by his parents' example. That's why he couldn't fathom what had gone off track. You'd think, an adult and modern man, 
strong and confident, yet now he was on his knees, ready to burst into tears. His beloved wife had left him. He understood that he couldn't win her back, since even on his knees, he couldn't melt her heart. He couldn't reach her, even though he was certain she still loved him. Victoria ran out of the building and got into her car. For the first time in her life, she was about to drive while not completely sober. But she didn't care now. She needed to get away from here as fast as possible. Forever. All this time, Zara had fervently hoped that Victoria would return safe and sound. But upon seeing her deathly pale face, she understood that everything had been more complex than they thought. How are you? Do you want to talk or maybe some wine? No, I don't want anything. Have you managed to sort things out? Yes, we can go now. Then let's go right now. Zara and Brian sold their restaurant and their home. They too were afraid of further attacks from Anderson. They weren't sure if his wife's threats would affect him. And besides, the girls couldn't even imagine living apart from each other. Seeing all this, Brian himself suggested a couple of days ago. Let's all escape together, sell the restaurant and the house move to another city, and start fresh. His idea greatly appealed to the friends. After a brief discussion, they agreed to settle in a seaside town. They hadn't fully decided what they would do next, but they were confident that things would work out. Victoria didn't want to take her car, as it could be traced. She had already found someone who promised to provide her with new documents, as well as Zara and Brian. They needed to visit him before embarking on their journey. I'll finally get rid of this name, Victoria said with a smile as they pulled up to the house of the person who dealt in fake documents. And what will you be called? Zara asked curiously. We'll find out now. Fifteen minutes later, the friends were already headed toward the city where they planned to start their new life. Zara looked at her new documents and could hardly believe it. Now you're Miranda, and I'm Nicole. Do we need to call ourselves by our new names? She asked her friend. Passports, driver's licenses, credit cards, they had everything in their hands. They had become completely different people, but they hadn't fully realized it yet. If no one's listening, there's no need to. We'll get used to it over time, I think. By the way, I'll be happy if you start calling me Miranda. I like that name much better, Victoria said with a smile. Brian, how do you feel about the name Edmund? The most important thing is... I'm still married to my Nicole, he said and chuckled. They had already driven about 300 kilometers when suddenly Victoria asked, Would you mind if we make a stop somewhere first? Of course, where do you want to go? Zero inquired. I want to see Adam. I need to apologize to him. He suffered a lot because of me. The city where Adam lived was almost on the way. They just needed to make a small detour, but then they could continue as planned. Victoria used to love him deeply. The thought of how much Adam had to endure because of her actions squeezed her heart with pain. She simply had to see him before disappearing forever into the mist of her new life. And don't you want to say goodbye to anyone else? Zara asked hesitantly. Victoria stared at her friend in confusion. Anyone else? I've already said goodbye to my mother, and I don't care about my brother anymore, nor does he care about me. You parted ways with her so harshly. I think it'll haunt you. I still don't understand how you could say all those things to her. Zara, it's hard to call that woman a mother. For the first time in my life, I was able to stand up to her, and I don't regret anything. She's not a mother. She's a monster. If you knew what my childhood was like, you would understand me. We're almost there, Brian unexpectedly said, seeing a sign with the name of the city where Adam lived. They had about 10 more kilometers to go before reaching Adam's house. Zara couldn't shake off the shock after her friend's story. Yay, my mom was completely different. Suddenly, she passed away early. From my childhood, I only remember good things about her. I can't even imagine how you managed to grow up as a relatively sane person. I've always dreamed of having a kind and loving mother, Victoria said sadly. I saw that side of her. She was like that but only with my brother. That's why I thought I was to blame for her not loving me. I tried to become better for her sake, but she didn't notice anything. And if she did, she only mocked my efforts. All right, girls, we've arrived, Brian said. 
parking near an old five-story building. Victoria had been to Adam's house only once before. He had invited her over to introduce her to his mother. That was a couple of months before their breakup. Will you wait for me? I'll try to be quick. Don't rush, take your time. Most likely, we'll have to spend the night at a hotel anyway. Victoria nodded and got out of the car. She easily recognized his entrance. She climbed up to the second floor, stopped for a few seconds outside the apartment with the number 25 to catch her breath and gather her thoughts, and then knocked on the door. Adam's mother opened the door. She didn't recognize Victoria right away. They had only met once before, and it was a long time ago. Hello, Pamela. Can I see Adam move? Victoria asked. Hello, who are you? Well, wait a moment. We've met before. My name is Victoria. Exactly, Victoria. His mother said, and then shouted, Adam, you have a guest. When Victoria was heading to him, she somehow assumed that Adam was still on crutches or lying in bed, but she was mistaken. He had come out, though he limped slightly. Seeing her, he quickened his pace and approached. Without asking for permission, he embraced her tightly and pressed her against his chest. Victoria definitely didn't expect such a welcome. Different scenarios of their future meeting had played in her head, but this one wasn't even in the best of them. Hey, sweetheart, I'm so glad you came. How are you? Did you leave him? Adam asked with a smile. Victoria smiled widely. Seeing Adam made her so joyful, and even more so, she was relieved that he didn't hate her as she had thought. Hey, how are you? I've heard so much that I can't wrap my head around it. I thought you were still recovering. That's how it was. I only recently started running again. I was actually planning to come to you myself when Zara called and asked about what happened. Then I guessed that you'd be coming soon. I was afraid of missing you, so I've been waiting for you all these days. You were waiting for me. Victoria couldn't believe her ears. She was on the verge of tears right now and was struggling to contain her emotions. Of course, just the thought of you helped me get back on my feet. Adam, I'm so sorry, so sorry that all this happened to you. Victoria said and couldn't hold back her emotions any longer, bursting into tears for the first time in these past few days. Adam hugged her as tightly as he could. Suddenly, his mother entered the hallway, saying, I understand that you need to talk, so I'm going over to my friend's place. If you need anything, just call. I'm glad to see you again. She gave Victoria a kind smile before leaving. Thank you, I'm glad too, Victoria replied, still sobbing. When the young people were left alone, Adam escorted her to the living room and offered her tea, but she declined. She didn't want to lose sight of him even for a second. Victoria, did you leave him? He asked again. Yes, finally. All thanks to Zara. I didn't even realize the hell I was living in, and I'm scared to think what would have happened next. And what do you plan to do now? He asked with hope in his voice. Adam had decided that since she came to him, they would definitely be together now. He had been waiting for their reunion for all these years. Lots of Victoria had helped him survive the army, even though it wasn't easy there. And when he was in the hospital, he only thought about her. And when he was relearning to walk at home, Victoria briefly recounted everything that had happened and about the plans she and Zara had made with Brian. Are you leaving again? Adam asked with a hint of sorrow in his voice. Come with me, she suggested. Adam hesitated. He hadn't even planned to move in the next few days. He still had to sort out the cart matters. There were too many of them that had accumulated. Sweetheart, I can't right now. I can't leave my mom. I was actually planning to find a job first to pay off the debts. Maybe you can stay, he said. Adam, I can't. I'm afraid he'll look for me. I want to go as far away as possible. Disappear. Don't worry about the money. I didn't leave empty-handed. After all, you suffered because of him, so he should pay. And my mom, once we're settled, we'll take her with us. How about that option? Victoria, do you want me to go with you? Adam asked uncertainly. I mean, do you still love me? Victoria looked him straight in the eyes and smiled her most beautiful smile. I tried to deceive myself. I thought I didn't love you anymore, that the feelings were gone. I thought you had abandoned me. I was angry for a long time, but now, when I saw you, I felt so warm inside. I think I've loved you all this time. 
I just hid these feelings deep inside. Will you hide them anymore? I won't hide them anymore, she said and kissed Adam. The kiss was so pleasant and sensual, as if they had never parted, as if there hadn't been two years of that abusive marriage, as if she had become herself again. Even better, she had become stronger, but she still loved him. Let's not rush, okay? Victoria requested, pulling back slightly after the kiss. Adam agreed. He was willing to do anything just to be with her again. Two months passed. Miranda, formerly Victoria, sat on the seashore, enjoying the morning chill. She and Adam had gotten married a month ago, and they were happier than ever. Well, he had married Miranda, not Victoria. They had settled in a small town by the sea with their friends, just as they had planned. The girls had gotten used to using their new names to avoid arousing suspicion from those around them. Nicole and Edmund, formerly Zara and Brian, bought a small house and decided to become restaurateurs again. A month ago, they had opened a restaurant. Their friend's wedding had been the first celebration there. That's when they showed the whole town how skilled they were at hosting events. Adam and Miranda decided to get into the hotel business. They bought an old hotel that was in terrible condition. The last repairs were finishing up, and preparations were underway before they could welcome their first guests. Two weeks after settling in the new place, Miranda finally got in touch with Madeline and began her psychotherapy sessions, but they were conducted online. Both of them found this arrangement suitable. Once they had established a session schedule, Madeline received her first payment on her account. However, the amount slightly puzzled her, so she decided to call Miranda. Did you make a mistake with the payment? She asked when Miranda answered the call. No, it's correct. It's my way of thanking you for your help. And from now on, you'll be paid for the sessions, Miranda explained. Isn't $3,000 too much for a single free consultation? No, it's not too much. I'm really grateful to you. Perhaps if it weren't for your help, I would still be married and unhappy, but now everything has changed. Miranda still wondered why Madeline had agreed to help her for free. She wanted to ask her about it, but hesitated. This morning, like usual, she took her little West Highland White Terrier for a walk on the beach. She sat by the shore, watching her dog chasing seagulls, when Adam quietly approached from behind. Good morning, beauty. Did you leave me in bed again? He asked with a smile. You were sleeping so peacefully, I didn't want to wake you. Miranda replied and kissed her husband. So, are you ready to see your mom again? Is she willing to move in with us? Yes, I called her yesterday after you went to bed. She'll be happy. I promised her that as soon as her room is ready, we'll come for her. That's great. Next week, I think we can already bring her over to our place. But you know, Adam, I have one unfinished business left. Maybe before that, we can make a stop somewhere, or I can go alone, and you can handle things here. No, I won't let you go alone. I don't want to be away from you for another day. Is it far we need to go? Where are you planning to go? Louise. This girl had been haunting Miranda all these days, sometimes before falling asleep. She imagined how her pregnant future daughter-in-law was living, and how much she still had to endure. Miranda couldn't leave things like that. She had to at least try to change everything. If it didn't work out, she would have to let go and move on. But she needed to try, even though returning to those places was a bit frightening. When Adam learned about his wife's plans, he wasn't exactly thrilled. No, he wasn't afraid, but he worried that something might not go according to plan. Especially since the plan itself wasn't that well thought out. How could it be when there were so many variables and unknowns? All right, let's go. I won't let you go alone, that's for sure. But let's agree, if she doesn't want to come, you'll leave things as they are, and you have to be emotionally prepared for that outcome, that it might happen. I understand everything, dear, and I'm glad you'll be going with me, his wife said with a smile. The next morning, they got into the car early and drove for hundreds of kilometers to rescue her pregnant future daughter-in-law from her abusive husband. Miranda was really hoping that Louise would listen to her. She had prepared a whole speech for her, but still worried that it might not work. During the rest of the journey, they discussed their future hotel, which would soon be ready for the grand opening. Suddenly, Adam asked, By the way, 
What do you think my mom could do to keep herself occupied? Something that wouldn't strain her too much, but also wouldn't let her get bored. She doesn't like sitting still for long. I know her. Mirakanda fell silent, her face taking on a mysterious expression. She hadn't had time to think about that yet. Well, what does your mom enjoy doing? She inquired. I'm not really sure. She's into a lot of things. I think we'll need to clarify this with her first. Then we can decide, so that it doesn't seem like we're imposing something she doesn't like. Agreed. Adam nodded, then gestured toward a sign. They were entering the town where her brother lived. Miranda didn't know his address. She didn't even have her brother's phone number, but she managed to find Louise's Instagram page. It was like a photo diary shopping, restaurants, fitness clubs, strolls. But there was a pattern. Every Wednesday, she attended prenatal yoga and took photos there. That's where they decided to catch her. They set off on a Tuesday and arrived in the evening. They checked into a hotel for the night and set off early in the morning to the fitness center, as they didn't know the exact time. Adam was driving, and Miranda had prepared a gym bag in advance, as if she intended to work out. They had to wait for a few hours until she finally spotted Louise. As soon as Louise entered the building and her brother's car drove away, Miranda headed toward her. She entered the gym, paid for a single visit, asked about the facilities, and went to find her future daughter-in-law. Louise was still in the changing room and was quite surprised when she saw her future mother-in-law. Hi, remember me? Miranda asked with a smile. Hi, what are you doing here? Louise said, sounding surprised. Don't worry, everything's fine. I'm here for you. We need to talk, but we don't have much time. When is Jack coming to pick you up? In two hours, the confused girl replied. Miranda placed her hands on her slightly rounded belly, as if protecting it. Louise, can you spare me five minutes, please? Sure, go ahead, the bride-to-be said, sounding unsure. Just understand me correctly. I wish you well. I know my brother treats you poorly. You look like a frightened deer. It's obvious to anyone. I want to ask you one question, but it might sound strange. Okay, Miranda asked, looking around to make sure no one was eavesdropping. What other question? Lise responded. Do you want to change everything? Do you want to change your life? Are you ready to leave your husband and start over? You need to think quickly. If you agree, I can help you. Yes, I've heard that you left your husband and disappeared, but how did you manage it? The same way you will. I promise you, it's not safe for you to be here either. I heard Jack talking to your ex the other day. He's looking for you everywhere. Louise, right now it's not about me, it's about you. After our meeting, I can't forget the look in your eyes. I immediately realized that your family is just like mine was, maybe even worse. Louise unconsciously pulled her shirt sleeve down a bit, trying to conceal something. Miranda took her by the hand and lifted the sleeve, revealing a huge bruise the mark of fingers. This is pretty much what I'm talking about. It's only going to get worse. I'm suggesting you run away, right now. I guarantee you'll be safe. But I'm pregnant. Yes, dear, I know. Understand that you're not just answering for your life, but also for the life of your future baby. Do you think it'll be good for him to be around such a father? I don't know. Some kind of father is better than no father at all. It finally dawned on Miranda. She had no knowledge of Louise's past. Did you grow up in an orphanage? At first, my grandmother raised me, but then she died. That's when I met Jack. He helped me a lot. That was a long time ago. Does he still help you a lot now? In any case, Louise, we need to decide right now. Time is short. Please think about it. I really want to help you. Louise lowered her gaze. She remembered something. It was a problem. I don't have any documents. They're in Jack's safe. Miranda had anticipated something like this and had thought ahead about this aspect. Oh, that issue can be easily resolved. I just need your consent. Louise nodded her head. She couldn't believe this was happening for Raoul. Louise, I understand that we only met once and you don't know me, but believe me, I'll help you escape from your husband once and for all. Just say yes, and I'll never see him again. The girl asked with frustration. You won't, but I promise you'll be glad about it soon, not sad. How is that? 
Please, we're running out of time. Are you in? Give me a minute, please. I need at least a minute to think, she pleaded. Miriam has stepped away a few meters and sat on a bench, as if preparing to change clothes. Louise stared at her locker. Her gaze was empty and melancholic, as if her world had just turned upside down. She stood like that for a few minutes, then turned to Miranda with a frightened expression and said, I agree. Miranda was relieved to hear her consent. She hugged Louise and whispered in her ear, Everything will be fine. Don't worry. We'll manage. A few minutes later, they left the building through a back exit. Adam was already waiting for them. He was somewhat surprised. Somehow, he had been convinced that Louise wouldn't agree. The two women sat together in the back seat. Miranda decided that the bride-to-be needed support. She wanted to be by her side as they drove away, just to make sure she didn't change her mind. Meet my husband, Adam. Miranda introduced with a satisfied smile. Husband, Louise exclaimed. But how? Just like that, dear. I managed to escape, and you can too. Let's go, she asked her husband. Thirty minutes later, they had left the city and were heading towards their new home. They made only one stop along the way, to obtain new documents for Louise. Luckily, Miranda already had contacts for this. She had informed her acquaintance in advance that help would be needed again. Miranda asked Louise to get rid of her phone so they couldn't be tracked. It turned out she didn't have any numbers saved for the future. No friends, no acquaintances, nobody at all. I told you that your husband was looking for you, right? I mean, I understand that he's now your ex-husband. You told me, but now you understand why he couldn't catch me, right? I think he won't give up. I overheard their conversation back then. He said he'd turn the whole world upside down to find it. Aren't you scared? That's when Miranda realized that she should have sent compromising information about Anderson sooner. She should have occupied him with something more serious, so there wouldn't be enough time to search for his runaway wife. On the way, they stopped at an internet cafe in a small town. They could use the computer there. She created a new email under a fictional name and sent a message to both of his partners, attaching files from a flash drive. How did it all end? She never found out, but deep down, she hoped that Anderson had at least survived. After all, she didn't wish him death. When they finally arrived home, the first thing Louise saw was the sea. She had dozed off during the last few kilometers of the drive, and when she opened her eyes, she saw it a vast and beautiful sea. Oh my god, I haven't been to the sea in ages, it's so amazing here, and that smell, she exclaimed, inhaling the sea breeze deeply. Now we'll be living here, Miranda said as she got out of the car. I won't be a bother, will I? Lees asked. Well, we're kind of family in a way, if you haven't forgotten. I lost a brother, but I hope to gain a sister if you're okay with that. And a nephew, Lees added with a smile as she caressed her belly. Miranda's greatest concern was that because of Jack's behavior, Louise might struggle to love her own child. However, after talking to her for a while, Miranda realized that the situation wasn't as dire as she had feared. During the first few days, Louise appeared calm and even joyful, but at some point, her mood changed dramatically. She withdrew to her room and hardly came out. Miranda began to worry about her. That evening, she had a session with Madeline, and she couldn't hold back, telling her everything. Do you know how we can cheer her up? I've run out of ideas. She's been in her room for two days straight, and things were going so well at first. From Madeline's expression, Miranda could tell that things were worse than she had thought. The psychologist pondered for a few seconds before asking, do you have another guest room? Of course, we do. When are you planning to leave? Tomorrow morning, early. All right. I'll email you the address, and it's on the house. Thank you so much. When Madeline's car entered the hotel premises, it was already dark. Miranda came out to greet her guest herself. She was so thrilled, as if her own mother had arrived. She had become so attached to this kind and yet stern woman. Madeline looked great. At first, Miranda, then known as Victoria, had thought she was just a bit over 30, but as she got to know her better, she realized Madeline was already in her 40s. They exchanged warm greetings. It seemed that Madeline was also pleased with the in-person meeting. 
Let's have me talk to Louise first, and then you can treat me to dinner, she suggested. Miranda nodded and led her into the bride's room. She was now called Penny, but she hadn't quite gotten used to the new name, or to everything that had happened to her, for that matter. The changes had been too swift. Madeline spent over an hour in the young pregnant woman's room. When she came out, it was hard to read her emotions. So, how is she doing? Miranda inquired. Well, I might need to stay with you for a while, if you don't mind, Madeline replied. I'm all for it. I hope your help will make a difference for her. It definitely will, but she'll need more time than you. She was under her husband's influence for far too long. Madeline stayed at the hotel for another month. She had grown fond of living by the sea and decided to move there permanently. Nearby was a rehabilitation center for women who had experienced violence, and they were in need of skilled professionals. She sold everything and relocated. Madeline's psychological support greatly helped Louise. With each passing day, she grew stronger, and her belly rounded more. The new hotel was already bustling with guests. Adam's mother, Pamela, also moved with them. She expressed a desire to work with flowers and beautify the area around the hotel. Louise felt restless sitting idle. She offered to help in the kitchen, as she loved cooking. It was there that she started responding to her new name, Penny. It was also there that she met the charming chef named Eric. Initially, she didn't even realize that he was interested in her. It was beyond her comprehension that a pregnant woman could attract someone. But a few days before giving birth, Eric confessed his feelings to her and proposed, suggesting they get married so their child would be born into a legal marriage. When Penny gave birth and regained some strength, they finally decided to have a wedding. They organized a small celebration at a restaurant, inviting all their new friends and acquaintances. Nicole, formerly Zara, offered to help with the organization. She was also thrilled that Miranda's sister, who was once a bride-to-be, had managed to escape the clutches of her tyrant husband. The two women had become friends and supported each other in their new endeavors. The wedding was joyful and vibrant. Though some guests were a bit surprised that they hadn't hired a wedding planner, the couple didn't explain anything, even though Eric was partially aware of what had happened to his young bride. The girls reveled until dawn. They headed home when most of the guests had dispersed. After the wedding, Penny and Eric were left with nothing but positive emotions. They looked so wonderful together. After Miranda and Adam were finally alone after the wedding, he looked dreamily at his wife. Have you seen their daughter? She's so adorable. Yeah, she's really cute. Simply a marvel. And she's got a good daddy. Do you want a child? Don't you? I do, but let's not rush for now. I haven't fully adjusted to our new life yet. I want to savor each other a bit more. Are you okay with that? I'm ready to wait. Adam said with a smile and kissed his wife. 